now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Can you believe I'm back? Yes, we made it. A uh, comedy-filled Monday with episodes of Amos and Andy, Jack Benny, our Miss Brooks. Uh, We will have Fibber McGee and Molly and an episode of Claudia and a look at, uh, as we salute, uh, Sunday, April 22nd, 1951. Thanks for being with us on this Monday 22nd day of April, 113th day of the year, 253 days left until, if you could believe what's gone on in the last 48 hours since I did this, the last podcast, the Sunday podcast, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, Congress placed the coi- passed the Coinage Act on this date in 1864, which mandated that the inscription in God We Trust be placed on all coins minted as U.S. currency. Uh, all other in God we trust. All others pay cash. Uh, in 1876, Boston Red Stockings defeated the Philadelphia Athletics six to five in the first National League baseball game. And of course, today the Boston Red Stockings are the Boston Red Sox, and the Philadelphia Athletics will soon be the uh, Las Vegas A's. Go figure. At high noon on this date in 1889, thousands rushed to claim land in the land rush of 1889. Within hours, the cities of Oklahoma City and Guthrie are formed with populations of at least 10,000. 1912, Pravda, the voice of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, began publication in St. Petersburg. In 1930, the UK, Japan, U.S. signed the London Naval Treaty, regulating submarine warfare and limiting shipbuilding. And uh, that would change in 1939, you know. In 1945, after learning the Soviet forces had taken Eberswald without a fight, Adolf Hitler admitted defeat in his underground bunker and stated that suicide would be his only recourse. The first televised atomic bomb test took place on this date at the Nevada test site near Las Vegas. 18, 19, 20. What the other hand, there it is, that brilliant flash, that white light that precedes the explosion of the atomic bomb number 17. 40 miles away, a brilliant white flash, almost blinding with those rocket trails coming out of it. We had a report from the uh, telephone company uh, that fed the picture from Los Angeles to where we brought it uh, all the way across the country. That reception was perfect all the way through, and we're delighted about it, of course. That atomic test on this date in 1952 took place 163 miles south-southwest of where I am here in Ely, Nevada. And we have people locally who are still being treated that, the downwinders. Uh, in 1954, the Army McCarthy hearings began. The average American can do very little insofar as digging communist espionage agents out of our government is concerned. They, they, they must depend upon those of us whom they send down here uh, to man the watchtowers of the nation. And I will say that McCarthy did some good things. I will also say that McCarthy got real nuts at times. Uh, in 1964, the 64-65 New York World's Fair opened on this date in 1964. President Lyndon Johnson spoke at the fair speaking words of peace and unity. I prophesy peace is not only possible in our generation. I predict that it is coming much earlier. And if I am right, then at the next World's Fair, people will see and America as different from today as we are different from 1939. The president also spoke about civil rights, not knowing demonstrations protesting just outside the arena where he was speaking. 
Uh, first Earth Day celebrated on this date in 1970. Uh, at a celebration 20 years later, Tom Cruise spoke out about, about the environment. If we make the environment sick, it's going to make us sick. Our future is our children's future. Our children's children's future. They're crying out. We cannot let them down. The event on the West Lawn of the Capitol featured other celebrities, including John Denver. 1993, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington dedicated. 1998, Disney's Animal Kingdom opened at Walt Disney World near Orlando. In a pre-dawn raid on this date in 2000, federal agents seized six-year-old Elian Gonzalez from his relative's home in Miami. And in 2008, the U.S. Air Force retired the remaining F-117 Nighthawk aircraft in service. Among those passing away on this date in history, British auto manufacturer Henry Royce, actor Will Gear, also Earl Father Hines, photographer Ansel Adams, uh, actor Albert Salami, uh, also President Richard Nixon passing away on this date, humorist Irma Bombeck, Pat Tillman, killed in action as a U.S. Army Ranger, best known as his football career. Singer-songwriter Paul Davis, also uh, Richie Havens, Here Comes the Sun, passing away on this date. And Joni from Happy Days, Aaron Moran, passing away. Among those born on this date, they include the wonderful singer-songwriter, Glenn Campbell. How would you like to be remembered? Uh... Just for what I am, that's, you know, it's, I'm Glenn Campbell and I believe in God and I believe in other people like the way you want to be treated and to help others, less fortunate. Music is really incredible, you know, it's just, it's something you just, it's a gift and I try to do that and, uh, wow, I'm thankful. It's knowing that your door's always open and your path is free to walk That makes me tend to leave my sleeping bag rolled up and stashed behind your couch Passing away in 2017 at the age of 81, Glenn Campbell, born on this date. And we need people like him. Our audio uh, courtesy of USA Today. Also born on this date. From Green Acres, Eddie Albert. TV producer Aaron Spelling. Pinup model Betty Page. And actress Charlotte Ray. All born on this date in history. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. I got to say, of all the passings uh, of, of musicians and artists and all that, Glenn Campbell's affected me the most. Uh, those still with us include Jack Nicholson. Uh, he is truly older than dirt at 87. Uh, Mel Carter, hold me, kiss me, thrill me, hold me, hold me, never let me go. Mel Carter, 85 today. Peter Frampton. Frampton comes alive, 74 years old. From The Last Starfighter and Night of the Comet, Catherine Mary Stewart is 65. Can you believe how many people thought this last eclipse was going to be like the Night of the Comet? They they did. It was To me, it was really weird that people were thinking that. Uh, from Whose Line Is It Anyway in the Drew Carey Show? Ryan Stile, 65. Laura Palmer of Twin Peaks. Is Cheryl Lee is 57. Uh, actress, comedian, television personality, Sherry Shepard, 57. Asia Songbird, Regina Velasquez, 54. From Pineapple Express, Justice League, and Aquaman, Amber Heard, and from a lot of other things that I don't want to get into, Amber Heard, 38. And rapper Machine Gun Kelly, 34. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the 22nd day of April as their birthday. And if this happens to be your birthday... We baked you a birthday cake. If you get a tummy ache. And you moan and groan and woe. Don't forget we told you so. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> <laughs> Make a wish, dear, and blow out the candles. Here they go. <laughs> 
Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Okay, uh, we're going to start the first of three shows from 73 years ago today, April 22nd, 1951, and we'll lead off with Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell as Amos and Andy. I'm Wyatt Cox, and this is Classic Radio Theater. Are you suffering with anxiety, depression, PTSD, an eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem? If it's causing problems at work or with your family, get help now. At Insight Mental Health and Wellness, we help and treat all types of depression and mental issues. We will help you use your insurance to get away from it all, to a beautiful sunny and tranquil vacation-like environment, so you can recharge yourself. And with the Family Medical Leave Act, you could take the time off you need from work. Plus, with the Affordable Care Act, your treatment could be 100% covered. If you're suffering from any kind of anxiety, depression, PTSD, eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem, use your insurance and get away from it all. Come to sunny California. Call Insight Mental Health and Wellness now. 800-281-8944 800-281-8944 800-281-8944 That's 800-281-8944 A Monday edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox now with Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell in the first of three shows. Uh, taking a look back at Sunday, April 22nd, 1951, Amos and Andy. Andy, you know what that music say? Yes, sir, Amos. That music say good health to all from Rexall. The Amos and Andy Show, with Ernestine Wade, Lou Lubin, Johnny Lee, Amanda Randolph, Will Wright, Shirley Mitchell, Vince Townsend, Jeff Alexander's music, and radio's all-time favorites, Amos and Andy. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Amos. You know, I wish I could take all of you with me on a tour of Rexall's big laboratories. There you would see for yourself how Rexall scientists check and recheck, test and retest the drug products that bear the name Rexall. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, then you would know, as I do, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Kingfish got a rather startling bit of news this week. When he got home from the uh, lodge hall the other night, his wife Sapphire informed him that she was leaving to spend three weeks with her married sister in Chicago. Now listen, honey, you can't go away like this and leave me all alone. You can't run off to Chicago and desert me. You can't desert your poor, poor husband. Well, all right, George. If you feel that way, I won't go. Holy mackerel, I overdid it, George. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? I mean, I uh, just uh, thinking of you, honey. The, the trip is going to do you good. I know that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, George, while I'm gone, is you going to write to me? Well, I don't think I'll have to this trip, honey. I got 12 bucks. That ought to tide me over already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got about as much love and affection in you as a dried apricot. Well, now listen. You got to face it. After 20 years of marriage, the love light is working on a weaker battery. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, honey. I, I really gonna miss you here by myself. Well, George, while I'm gone, you ain't gonna be completely alone. Uh, just how uh, incompletely alone is I gonna be? <laughs> George, while I'm gone, I've asked my mother to come over here and stay with you. Now I'm going in and pack. Holy smokes, you leaving and your mama coming. That's like trading Dracula for Frankenstein. <laughs> what did you say? I said, to be frank with you, honey, I hope you have a nice time. Oh, I, I... <laughs> now, see here, George, whether you like it or not, Mama is going to stay here. And while Mama is here, I want you to show her all the respect that she deserves. Well, if it does that, she's going to hit me in the face. I... <laughs> George, I'm warning you. I had a long talk with Mama this morning. She's a dear, sweet woman, always kind and considerate. 
And while she's here, she's determined to win your love and affection if she has to flatten out that head of yours to do it. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sandra, I'm going to be spending more time here at the Lodge Hall now that the invasion has done started. <laughs> yeah, well, that is something. Your mama-in-law coming to stay with you while Sapphire's in Chicago. You know, Kingfish, I never believed none of them mother-in-law jokes till I got a load of her. Yeah, it's really something having her cook the food for me and then sitting down at the table opposite her. Uh, pretty bad, huh? Well, last night for supper, she done stewed a flounder for four hours. And when she brung it to the table, that dead fish looked more appetizing than she did. <laughs> yeah, well, uh... He's got a better shape to start with. <laughs> Listen, Nanda, I tell you, I just got to find some way to get rid of that old gal. Well, you has been pretty successful when it comes to relative vacation in the past. Well, I've been pretty successful with my brother-in-law, Leroy. When he arrives, I usually give him a pretty strong hint that he ain't welcome. Well, how you do that, Kingfish? Well, when he comes to the door, I reaches out and extends the hand of friendship. Mm -hmm. And while he's shaking this hand like this... I let him have a rabbit punch behind the ear with, uh, with the other hand. <laughs> and then without further ceremony, I flips him down the front stairs. By the time he hits the pavement, why, his visit is over, you see? Yeah, well, that don't sound like the technique to use on your mother-in-law. You ain't gonna get far trying to jujitsu no 400-pound walrus, I tell you that. <laughs> of course, I was just thinking I might uh, try the, the, the medical technique that like I done with Sapphire's Aunt Minerva last Christmas. She's the one with the big appetite, you know. Oh, medical technique, huh? Well, uh, what was that, KP? Well, when uh, Minerva come in the living room uh, with a suitcase, I threw a 20-minute fit. Hmm. But it didn't work. Uh, when I come to, she would barricade herself in the bedroom with a half a chicken, you see. She goes, yeah. <laughs> well, there again, your mom-in-law don't look like the type that's going to be scared off by no fits. You know, Andy here, I think the only thing to do is to try a different approach. Than I ever used before. I just thinking here. Yeah. This time while Sapphire's in Chicago, I gonna try to be sweet and kind to the old lady. And instead of trying to get out, maybe we can get along together nice, you know. Yeah, sweetness and kindness. It might work. I think I read someplace that Clyde Beatty used that system when he was trying to work a new rhinoceros into his act. <laughs> Get on into the apartment here and try the sweetness approach on the old gal. Yeah. Who's that? Uh, good evening, mother-in-law dear. May I say that you was looking perfectly sweet and charming this fine evening? George Stevens, how dare you come home in this condition, you punk! <laughs> now, wait a minute, mother-in-law dear. I ain't in no condition. You know I was a teetotalitarian. <laughs> I was fond of you, mother-in-law, dear. Ha! You is up to something. Sapphire's father started talking that way once, and I woke up that night and caught him trying to drive a spike through the top of my head. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute, mother-in-law, dear. Wait a minute, nothing. Oh. What's this on your shoulder here? Hmm. A long hair. Oh, uh, but mother... And don't you try to tell me that come from that bald head noggin of yours. <laughs> now, now, look, mama, uh, uh, that's a horse hair from the pattern of my coat. And anyway, I wouldn't start chasing after women at my age. Your age is when they get dangerous. <laughs> Horses is always trying to kick up your heels before rheumatism sets in. <laughs> now, look, mother, uh, we're we going to be here together for three weeks. Couldn't we just try this once to get along together? Mm. Because I know that we both have respect for one another feeling why we can work this thing out. Ah, shut up! <laughs> Get your own supper. And don't you forget I'm keeping my eye on you. <laughs> Some mother-in-law, that is. I see better mothers in the bottom of a vinegar bottle. <laughs> Six o'clock in the morning, but I done made my bed. Now I get my breakfast before old Volcano Mouth gets up. <laughs> uh, well, let me get the newspaper from the hall first. 
Now, where's that paper? In the hall, there's some place. Uh oh. The door done closed. Mm, it's locked. I done left my keys on the dresser. Now I'm gonna have to run around, climb up the fire escape, and crawl in the bedroom window. Now, let me get in the open window here. Open it up. Uh, now, get in the bedroom here. Um, then I'll just go in. George Stevens, what do you mean by sneaking in this house at 6 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> well, I was... Now, just ju don't give me that old story about just going out to get the newspaper. Your bed ain't even been slept in. Well, I was... Uh, the thing is, you see, I had... I was... I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sapphire, I just have to call you up long distance. Something important has come up. What is it, Mother? That overripe Casanova is up to his old tricks. I found a woman's hair on his coat, and at 6 o'clock this morning, I caught him sneaking in the house. Oh, Mom. Oh, don't you worry about a thing, Sapphire. If that old Ferdinand is going to start sniffing flowers, he's going to end up with lilies on his chest. <laughs> Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Rexall MI-31 is a good example. Used full strength, this all-round mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant kills contacted germs in a matter of seconds. Yet it will not harm delicate mouth and throat membranes. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at any Rexall drugstore. Yes, that's why I come down here to see you, Lawyer Thompson. My daughter Sapphire is in Chicago, and I want something done about that no-good son-in-law of mine. Well, I don't know what he's done, but we'll throw him in jail and start from there. Ah, oh, that's the spirit! <laughs> Can't we get him on the charge we used when he first married my daughter 22 years ago? No, I'm afraid he's a little too old now for charges of juvenile delinquency. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, maybe we could commit him to the home for the aged and feeble again. <laughs> no, I'm afraid he enjoyed that too much the last time. Oh. <laughs> but I don't know about these suspicions of yours about him running after women. I'm afraid if we made those charges and then put Stevens on the stand, they'd laugh us out of court. Well, I to keep my eyes on him and I'll get the goods on him yet. And in the meantime, if you think of anything nasty we can do to him, let me know. Hey, Kingfish, I was surprised to see you down here at the lodge this early. By the way, how you coming along with the sweetness and light approach on your mama-in-law? Well, I tell you, Ender, using sweetness and light on that old gal is like pouring... Chanel number five on a goat. <laughs> no matter how much you pull on, the animule is always one step ahead of you. Yeah, well, where is the charming creature at the present time? Well, I don't know, Ender. She got up and went out early this morning. Left the dishes in the sink, the bed's unmade. Didn't speak to me all day yesterday. Oh, she done going to Brooklyn, all right. That's what she done going. She oh, done going back uh, home. Well, that's a good break, getting rid of the old spitfire. But tell me this, uh, who going to do the housekeeping for you? Yeah, well, that's what's been bothering me, ain't I ain't a domestic type, you know. Two more meals and I'll run out of clean dishes. <laughs> hey, I was just thinking here, Kingfish. You know, maybe my gal could kind of go up there and straighten out the mess. Uh, you mean that she'd do it for nothing? Well, I'd have to give her a little extra smooching. <laughs> but uh, I guess I can bear up under that. <laughs> Give me the phone here. I'll call her up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh... Yeah, she'll be glad to do it for me. We is practical engaged. Oh, you engaged to a hunt? That's good news. Hello? Hello. <laughs> How is the sweet Mona Lisa, 8th Avenue, this morning? Oh, I's fine, Andy. And how's my big old honey bear? 
Well, <laughs> your big old honey bear is just fine. Listen, Andy, cut out the mush and tell her about the mop, will you? Yes. <laughs> uh, can your little honey bear ask you something personal? Of course, Andy. Well, look here. A friend of mine needs somebody to kind of straighten out his apartment. I wonder if you could do it for me, sweet baby, honey lamb, sweet patootie. <laughs> to command and I'll obey. Ha! Ha! <laughs> oh, boy. Well, he lives in that big apartment house up on 138th Street, apartment 3A. He left the door open. Oh, well, I'll be glad to do it, Andy. I'll get up there right away. Oh, I knowed you'd do this for me, honey. After all, we is meant to each other. Heart of my heart. Farewell. Well, she gonna fix up my apartment. Now, that's nice of her, Uh, By the way, what's your gal's name? I don't know. I only met her last night. <laughs> hey, you want to shoot another game of pool, Kingfish? Uh, no, Andy. I think I'll go on home. Your gal probably got my apartment all cleaned up by now. Yeah, well, if she's still there when you get there, remember to find out what her name is for me, will you? Yes, hey, look who's coming in the pool hall here. Shorty the barber. Shorty, what you doing in here? I, I, I come down to, I'm looking for, I had to stop in and see. I, I, I mean, I, I came over to, I got, I got it. Uh, 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 <laughs> must have come down here for something. <laughs> a very well taken point there, Shorty. Yeah, say, you come in here all excited, Shorty. Something must be up. Oh, yeah, Ken Fish. I, I, I just ran into your mother-in-law on the street. Well, now, uh... Now, wait a minute, Shorty. Now, just, now, just a minute. Mm. My mother-in-law is back in Brooklyn. How you know it was my mother-in-law? Well, I said hello to her, and she hit me across the face. <laughs> yeah, that's her, all right. You got her. You got her. Listen, Kingfish, what would your mother-in-law be doing back here, Kingfish? Well, uh, I guess that uh, maybe she just didn't go back to Brooklyn after all. Yeah. Uh, maybe she just got up early, and she probably uh, went up to the house, uh, yeah. To the house. Holy smokes, Andy. When she runs into that gal friend of yours, what is she going to think? Hmm. Oh, I tell you, Andy, there's going to be blood on the carpet tonight, boy. <laughs> Holy mackerel, you was right, Kingfish. When that old war horse find that gal up there, she going to give a coming out party for your brains. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know what's, what it's all about, fellas, but... Kingfish, if you hurry, maybe you can beat your mother-in-law back to the, uh, to the apartment. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Kingfish. Then you can get the gal out of there, see? Yeah, that's what I'll do. Shorty, I noticed the car out in front. That's your car. I'll take it and I'll drive as fast as I can. Well, fine, Kingfish, but there's only one thing. You, uh, you see, you is, I mean, the thing, what you got to do is... is, now, is uh, now, listen, Shorty, I can't wait. I, I... Say, Shorty, what is that you was trying to tell the Kingfish? Well, I, I, I just wanted to say that... Uh, I, I thought he ought to, uh, he, he don't, uh, he should know that, that uh, you can, when I get, uh, 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 <laughs> no gas. Well, here's the apartment. I hope I got your former mother-in-law did. Uh, open up. Are you in there? Open up. Yes, yes, what is it? Uh, look, look, uh, I'm, uh, 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 Mr. Stevens, uh, the thing, uh, uh... Mr. Stevens isn't here. I know he ain't here. Well, then why is you asking for him? Uh, uh, look, I'm Mr. Stevens. Oh, you poor old man. Uh, <laughs> look, uh, uh, sweet patootie, uh, you, you gotta get out of here. My mother-in-law's on the way up here. If she finds you here, she'll never understand. Well, I can explain to her what I'm doing here. Now, listen... That sweater you were wearing would counteract any explanation you can give. <laughs> now, now, come on. But, Mr. Stevens... Come on, hurry up. Come on. Down the steps. Oh, there's someone coming up. Listen, old lady, don't block the stairs. I'm trying to get this gal out before my mother-in-law sees her. Josh Stevens? Mother-in-law. What's the meaning of this? Mother-in-law, dear, uh, I'd like to present you with my long-lost sister from Australia, Sweet Patootie. <laughs> Here's your Rexall family druggist. It's still amazing and welcome news all over the country. 
Yes, friends, I'm talking about the quicker, better, more complete relief from cold symptoms that you get from Rexall's marvelous new product called Anapac. And here's why. Anapac combines a well-known antihistamine with the time-tested APC formula of aspirin, phenacetin, and caffeine. In this way, Anapac gives you not only the antihistamine effect of prompt relief from cold symptoms, but also relief from the muscular soreness, headaches, and fever that usually accompany a cold. And here's more good news. The drowsiness sometimes resulting from the use of antihistamine should seldom be encountered in this formula. Follow the recommended dosage and instructions on the label carefully, unless directed otherwise by your physician. Remember, for better all-round relief from cold symptoms, ask for Anapac. That's A-N-A-P-A-C, Anapac. The exciting new Rexall drug product available now at Rexall drug stores everywhere. <laughs> That's terrible. The kingfisher's mother-in-law misunderstanding a situation like that. I can't get over it, you know it? Yeah, that's something, all right. Yeah, I guess this ain't gonna sound good when Sapphire gets word of it out in Chicago, neither. Well, I tell you something, Mamus. This time, the old kingfisher's a man of action. He ain't gonna give her no chance. He done hauled his mama-in-law into domestic relations court. No fooling. You mean to say the kingfisher done took his mother-in-law to the domestic relations? He sure did. He said that she has always come between him and his wife. And him and his lawyer, Calhoun, is down in Judge Quigley's chamber right now. He's trying to get a court order to have his mom-in-law stop interfering. And then he's going to sue her for $10,000 if she don't. Mm, $10,000, huh? Yes, sir. He's going to sue her for alienating his wife's affliction. <laughs> You let go of me. Help, help. I'll fix you. I'll fix you. Your Honor, would you order this woman to stop hitting my client in the face? <laughs> Your Honor, this man belongs behind bars. Let me at him. Order, order, please. Let us have a little order. I asked you to come here to my chambers to see if we could work out a peaceful solution. I don't think we're getting off to too good a start. Now, which one of you is counsel for Mr. Stevens? I am, Your Honor. Al Gunkwin J. Calhoun <laughs> and my poor, poor client here, Innocent Stephen, is bringing the charges against his mother-in-law trying to get her to refrain from interfering with his domestic affairs. Well, yes, sir, that's all I want to do, Your Honor. Well, that's a legitimate request, if there are grounds for it. Grounds for it? Your Honor, this woman has caused my client undue mental anguish. She has broken his heart, damaged his reputation, Injured his pride and dealt a mortal blow to his soul. Your Honor, this is a nasty old walrus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's telling him, Calhoun. Your Honor, don't you listen to this little shrimp. I done caught this old goat here red-handed with a young hussy. What explanation has he got to that? Well, according to his deposition here, Mr. Stevens claims that this young girl was merely tidying up his apartment in the absence of his wife. Ha! Your Honor, I object. That ha is a deliberate attempt to cast aspersions on my client's character. If, that, if she's gonna ha, I demand that in the future she keep that sneer out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Smith, you will kindly control your comments. Oh, uh, yeah, and, and while we're at it, would you have her stop jabbing me in the back with her umbrella? I feel that it's against the best interest of my spine. <laughs> If anyone should be brought before this domestic relations court, it's this man, George Stevens. Why, this man has never supported his wife in 22 years of marriage. He's accepted money from his mother-in-law. She has supported them, paid their rent, bought their clothes, and he has never made any attempt to get a job in all this time. I object, Your Honor. The fact that my client is a bum has nothing to do with the question. <laughs> Him, Calhoun. <laughs> well, it appears to me that the question here has nothing to do with Mr. Stevens' unemployment or his past record as a husband. That should be brought up at another time. The question is, 
Is Mrs. Smith deliberately and maliciously attempting to come between husband and wife? Your Honor, I never done a malicious thing in my life. Oh, yeah, you is. How about the time you I had pneumonia and you tried to puncture a hole in my oxygen tent? How about that? <laughs> Your Honor, this woman has caused trouble. Your Honor, this is a mean old lady. Don't you talk that way. Don't you talk that way about me, you little weasel. Yeah, here, here, here. We'll have no more of this. Mr. Stevens, you claim this young woman was merely cleaning your apartment. Now, I think the whole crux of this thing is the truth of that statement. Your Honor, we have depositions here from two witnesses. Andrew H. Brown and Mark Morancy R. Lewis, better known as Shorty the Barber, stating that she was there for that purpose and that purpose only. Yes, I see the depositions here. Hmm. Well, Mrs. Smith, I am convinced that your son-in-law is telling the truth in this matter. No, sir, Your Honor, that's all I've been doing. I've been blabbing out the truth every word. I've been. It is the purpose of the Domestic Relations Court to maintain the family unit whenever possible. So I hereby rule that in all domestic arranged arguments, rather, between George Stevens and his wife, Sapphire, you, Mrs. Smith, are to refrain from all interference. Ain't he the sweetest judge? <laughs> it is also the ruling of this court that should any questions arise between husband and wife... You, Mrs. Smith, are ordered to remain silent at all times. Silent at all times. That is all. Thank you, Your Honor. Come along, Mrs. Smith. Well, Kingfish, we finally got your mother-in-law's mouth closed. That's the biggest job since they filled in the Gowanus Canal. <laughs> It's 6.30. Has you started breakfast yet? Yes, George. Now, uh, I want you to clean up the bedroom and scrub the kitchen. Yes, George. I'll get right at come it. Come back here, come back here. I ain't finished talking to you yet. Never turn your back on me while I'm speaking to you. I'll haul you right back in the court. You mess with me, boy. I'm sorry, George. And now another thing, mother-in-law, dear. Now that the judge has ordered you to keep that big mouth of yours shut, out of the very goodness of my heart, I was going to show you what I was doing coming in the other morning on the fire escape just to show you how wrong you was. What are you talking about? Well, now, look here. You stay here in the living room, and I'm going to show you. Right. Now, first of all, I went out the front door like this, and the door closed behind me and locked. Uh, now you stay inside there, and I'm going to take it step by step and show you. Now I'm going around the alley, and I'm going to climb up the fire escape, and I'm going to show you what happened. Hmm, I wonder who that can be. Oh, now where did George go? Hello, Mama. Why, Sapphire, what is you doing here? Well, we didn't expect you back from Chicago for another two weeks. Well, Mama, I got worried about that phone call. You saying George was chasing after some woman, so I decided to come back and get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Why is George anyhow? Well, Sapphire, you see... Oh, oh, there he is coming in the fire escape there. Oh, hello there, Sapphire. I didn't expect you so soon. Uh... I'll say you didn't. What is you doing sneaking in this house at 7 o'clock in the morning? Well, uh, mother-in-law, dear, tell Sapphire what I was doing. Uh, Mama, uh, uh, explain it to her. It is the ruling of the court in disputes between husband and wife. The mother-in-law will remain silent. <laughs> Here's your Rexall family druggist. There is an easy, safe, and convenient way to get more complete protection against vitamin deficiency. Take Rexall Plenamins. Yes, just two Plenamin capsules a day give you 10 essential vitamins, including vitamin B12, plus the nutritional extras of liver concentrate and iron. What's more, Plenamins cost you only pennies a day. Ask for Plenamins. P-L-E-N-A-M-I-N-S, Plenamins, at Rexall Drugstores everywhere. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, to visit your friendly Rexall Drugstore. Good night. See you next Sunday. Hiya, 
beautiful. Get lost, Bristle Puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else can I do? Silly boy, you can go stag. Go stag? Why? Because Stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like Stag Brushless Shave Cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close, face-happy shave. Join the Stag line at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care, go Stag. Be sure to be with us next Sunday at the same time when your Rexall druggist will again present the Avis and Andy Show. The Avis and Andy Show is written by Joe Connolly, Bob Mosier, and Bob Ross. Stay tuned for the Edgar Berg and Charlie McCarthy program, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Ken Niles speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And from 73 years ago, April 22nd, 1951, Amos and Andy here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The news from 73 years ago today comes up next. And then uh, Jack Benny and our Miss Brooks. That's all straight ahead. President Biden recently released a massive $6 trillion budget, the largest budget in U.S. history. And guess who pays the bill? That's right, you, the American taxpayer. American citizens and business owners will be paying more taxes. That's a fact. And if you owe back taxes, they will be coming after you to collect payments. In fact, President Biden also hired thousands more IRS agents to go after you. If you got a letter from the IRS and you know you owe back taxes or you haven't filed in years, don't put your head in the sand. Call us today. We've saved our customers millions of tax dollars. One quick, free phone call will show you how we can reduce your past tax bill and save you thousands, guaranteed, or you pay nothing. Call now. 800-932-1431. 800-932-1431. That's 800-932-1431. Paid for by the Tax Helpline. And on this Monday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we're starting off with a spotlight on Sunday, April 22nd, 1951. We opened with Amos and Andy, and right now, let's take a look at the headlines from the newspapers on that Sunday, 73 years ago. Republicans charged that the Truman administration tried to discredit General Douglas MacArthur as the historic split over a Far East policy heading toward a congressional uh, airing. Uh, Backers of the deposed Far East commander reacted angrily after reading a Washington dispatch in the New York Times. This dealt with President Truman's conference with MacArthur last October on Wake Island. It said, according to administrative reports at the time, MacArthur was so confident of victory in Korea, he offered what he deemed his best troops, the U.S. 2nd Division, for service in Europe. He apologized for embarrassing President Truman on the uh, issue of Formosa, the big island off the Chinese coast, and predicted the Chinese communists would not enter the Korean conflict. Several members of Congress took the view the administration had leaked one-sided information to show the general in the wrong. The government Saturday night announced a tough new price control policy forbidding industries to raise prices if profits exceed a set standard. Under this yardstick standard, no industry will be permitted to increase prices if the industry's dollar profits amounted to 85% or more of the average of its three best years during the four-year 1946 to 1949 period inclusive. The step announced by economic stabilizer Eric Johnston, one of a series of uh, de- measures designed to tighten inflation controls all along the line. Allied artillery and warplanes broke up communist efforts to reinforce their battered units on the Central Korean front Saturday and sent hundreds of North Korean Reds 
fleeing home in panic. Allied ground forces moved up quickly for substantial gains, according to the U.S. 8th Army. With 17 dead counted and 22 missing men presumed dead, two tankers that collided and exploded into cremating flames on the Gulf of Mexico headed for port Saturday night. The two tankers, the 26,000-ton uh, Esso Suez and the 10,000-ton Esso Greensboro collided in dense fog Friday 200 miles south of Morgan City, Louisiana. The Suez steamed Saturday under her own power for Mobile, Alabama, but was accompanied by the Esso New York. The Greensboro was taken in tow by another tanker and headed to Galveston, Texas. Hungary announced she is freeing Robert A. Vogler, a young American businessman who has spent 17 months in prison on spy charges. That in return for the granting of various just Hungar- Hungarian claims. Uh, Nathaniel P. Davis, the American minister, said a Hungarian foreign office communique announcing the completion of negotiations was correct and I am very pleased and he refused to comment further. And it came to pass that a policeman reading the Holy Scriptures came upon the words which solved a crime. Authorities of the land of Israel has apprehended a caravan of asses laden with contraband from the land of the Arabs across the Jordan. But those who owned the asses had slipped away in the night. A policeman read the words of the prophet Isaiah, and in the third verse of the first chapter came upon the words of light. The asses were withheld several days without food and released. The starved and braying beasts led the policemen to the den of the culprits. The culprits were so amazed by the police uh, that the the policemen read them this uh, passage. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. Those some of the day's top news stories. Somebody's going to take that and do something with that. Those some of the day's top news stories is reported in the newspapers of Sunday, April 22nd, 1951. On your radio at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, 4 o'clock Pacific Time, Jack Benny. And that's next on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Asses a plenty. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. That's 800-515-6302. Some of you say, why can't you just do this on the radio? Because if I had done that last story from Haifa, Israel... On the radio, I would have had people just, they would, these people would be talking about asses, they would want mine in a sling. Okay, uh, let us go now uh, from the news of Sunday, April 22nd, 1953, to an episode of the Jack Benny program. No asses on that show except maybe Dennis Day, 73 years ago, and the IRS comes around again. The Jack Benny Program, transcribed, presented by Lucky Strike. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky, strike, be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. When April showers start to fall, I never do complain. With better tasting Lucky Strike, I sing right in the rain. And you'll sing for joy, cause Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. 
I've made smoking test galore, and each time I agree, no smoke tastes like a Lucky Strike plus LSMFT. You'll agree, too. Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky, strike, be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. Friends, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette, and here's the reason. Fine tobacco, and only fine tobacco, always gives you the enjoyment of a better-tasting cigarette. And LSMFT, Lucky Strike, means fine tobacco. Tobacco that smokes smooth and mild, that gives you better taste with every puff. And what's more, every Lucky you light is guaranteed. Yes, of all the major brands, Lucky Strike and Lucky Strike alone has an unconditional guarantee right on the pack. So for everything you want in a cigarette, for complete smoking enjoyment, be happy, go lucky. Make your next carton Lucky Strike. You'll agree, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. Remember, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. <laughs> The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the Sportsman Quartet, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, spring is here, but to prove to you that the weather in California is always warm and sunny, we bring you one of our satisfied residents. <laughs> ah, listen to that little birdie singing. <laughs> anyway, it's spring, so let's go out to Jack Benny's house in Beverly Hills where we find Rochester cleaning the house. <coughs> Darn this dust. Doggone, I wish Mr. Benny would buy a bag for this vacuum cleaner. My pockets are full. <laughs> this is awful. Hey, I didn't turn the cleaner off. Uh-oh, the comas must have pulled out the plug. <laughs> well, I was finished anyway. Oh, hello, boss. Hello, Rochester. Say, you really got the house clean. Thanks. I was just out in the yard looking at the swimming pool. In Rochester, I think tomorrow you can turn the water on and fill it. But, boss, I thought you said... I know, but if it hasn't rained by this time, it's not going. <laughs> Sometimes I think that... I'll get it, Rochester. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Say, you're kind of early. We're not supposed to leave for the circus for nearly an hour. I know, Jack, but it's such a beautiful day, I left the house early and walked over. Oh. And as I came down Sunset Boulevard, some fresh guy pulled up to the curb and offered me a ride. No. Yeah, he thought he was smart just because he had a new Cadillac convertible. Yeah. Gee, it was windy with the top down. <laughs> Mary, you mean that you accepted a ride from a total stranger? Why, that's... Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack, I'm kidding. Kidding? Certainly. You don't think I'm the type of girl who lets herself get picked up by any guy in an auto? I don't know. That's how you met me. <laughs> Say, Mary... I'll get a laugh some way. Say, Mary... Mary, what's, uh... <laughs> Say, Mary, what's, what's that in your hand, huh? Oh, it's a letter from Mama. I thought you'd want to see it. A letter from your mother, eh? Well, what does nobody's friend Irma have to say? <laughs> I'll read it to you. <clears throat> <clears throat> My darling daughter, Mary, we are all very glad that you're over your five weeks illness and are appearing on Jack's program again. But it must be discouraging to go from unemployment insurance back to your regular salary. There's not enough difference to talk about. 
<laughs> Your sister, babe, has been home for a couple of weeks, and frankly, she's a little conceited because she replaced you on Jack's program. Now she wants them to put a star on her locker at the slaughterhouse. <laughs> Wait a minute, Mary. Babe is now working in a slaughterhouse? Yes. She's known as Hit Him in the Head Livingston. <laughs> But Mary... Oh, Jack, let me finish the letter, please. All right, go ahead, kid. <laughs> Last night we went... To... You don't generally get this much to do, you know. Go ahead. <laughs> Last night we went to a going-away party for your cousin Melvin. It was a nice affair, but I think it was silly of Melvin to put on a sailor suit just because you're sending him up the river. <laughs> Babe works in a slaughterhouse? <laughs> you know, Mary, your mother writes such a funny letter. Excuse me. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. I'm sorry I'm late. You're not late. You're early. I am? Yes. Gee, this daylight saving time has got me confused. <laughs> daylight saving time? Dennis, you're not supposed to turn your watch ahead till next Sunday. I forgot to turn it back from last year. <laughs> Well, then you're really late. Yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Dennis, you're starting to confuse me already. Now, do me a favor, will you? Go out, walk around the block, and come back, come back in again. Okay, goodbye. Uh, who was that, Jack? It was Dennis. He came in to wish me a Merry Christmas. What? I don't know. He gets me mixed up, too. I told him to walk around the block. Well, isn't he going to the circus with us? Yes, the whole gang's going, and I'm also taking some boys from the Beverly Hills Beavers. I better tell Rochester what time I'll be home. Rochester? Yes, boss? I'll be home about 6 o'clock for dinner, so don't forget to go to the market. I've already been to the market, boss. Oh, what did you buy? I gave you $5. Let me see. I bought 10 pounds of potatoes, 3 pounds of butter, 2 pounds of hamburger... A prime rib roast, eight pork chops, three pounds of bacon, a leg of lamb, and a sirloin steak. Oh, good, good. Where's the change? <laughs> change? Oh, did that all come to five dollars? Oh, no, boss. The five dollars ran out after the hamburger. <laughs> Oh, well, how'd you get him to give you the pork chops, the bacon, the egg, the leg of lamb, and the sirloin steak? I signed a contract. A contract with a butcher shop? Yeah, you're appearing there tonight. <laughs> what? And if you make good, I can book you at the Van Nuys a and <laughs> Rochester, don't go booking me for personal appearances. I've got an agent for that. Why do you think I pay him 9%? <laughs> Now, look, I want you... To... I'll get it. Hello? It's me. I'm lost. <laughs> oh, Dennis, don't be ridiculous. Where are you now? I'm doing my Christmas shopping. Now, cut that out. And if you want to go to the circus with us, you better get back here right away. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Silly kid. I wonder what he bought for me. <laughs> oh, well. I say, Mr. Benning... What is it, Rochester? After I serve dinner, can I have the rest of the evening off? Why? We're having a big party on Central Avenue for my friend Jerome, who got drafted. Well, certainly you... Wait a minute, Rochester. Your friend Jerome was drafted six months ago, and he's overseas now. Yeah, it's a shame he's gonna miss the party. <laughs> well, you can go, but don't stay out all... Oh, that must be Phil. He's going to the circus with us. Hello, Mr. Benny. Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. How did you get here so soon? Well, as soon as now, I now got... Now, hold it, Dennis. Oh, I don't want to get into another routine. And there's something else I want to tell you. Yeah, what? Now, look, at Mary's in the living room. Now, you know she was sick for several weeks. Uh -huh. Right now, she's feeling fine, so don't start any of your silly talk with her. I don't want her to have any trouble. Now, when you see her, just say hello. That's all. Just hello. Yes, sir. Jack, what took you so... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. Are you going to the circus with us? 
Hello. <laughs> Look, Dennis, you can say more than that. I can? Yes. Kiss me, Livy. Now stop! <laughs> Dennis. Dennis, look. Look at me. You want to hear the song I'm going to do on the program? That's exactly what I want. Now let's have it. Okay. Very good. Oh, it's not bad for a silly kid who has two shows, does personal appearances, and is now making a picture. <laughs> Dennis, you're, uh, you're making a picture? Yeah, 20th Century Fox. Gee, you have your own show, personal appearances, and now you're making a picture. When he starts playing meat markets, he'll be as big as you are. <laughs> Mary, how did you know? I bought a pound of liver and you were in the coming attractions. <laughs> Imagine getting the publicity out already. Hello? Hello, is this you, Jackson? Yes, Phil, are you going to the circus with us? Yeah, Jackson, but you better go on ahead because I'm going to be late. Late? Why? I've been rehearsing my band for a concert tour and it took longer than I figured. Why, what happened? We ran out of ice. <laughs> Yeah, whoever has an eight-bar rest mixes them. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> anyway, Jackson, you go on without me. I'll meet you at the circus. Okay, are you going to bring any of your, as it says on the payroll, musicians? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> yeah, Jackson, they'll all be there. Well, except uh, Sammy, my drummer, he hates circuses. Sammy hates circuses? Why? He used to work in one. He was the guy who put his head in the lion's mouth. <laughs> no. Why'd he give it up? He didn't give it up. The lion quit. <laughs> oh, well, I don't blame the lion. 
Sammy's head is the size of a watermelon. <laughs> of course, his isn't ripe yet. You're so right, I plugged it yesterday. <laughs> well, Phil, the next time you... There's someone at the door. I better say goodbye. So long, Jackson. I'll see you at the circus. Okay. What a day. The door, the phone, the phone, the door. Oh. Oh, I wasn't expecting you, Mr. Collins. Uh, Mr. Benny, the Department of Internal Revenue suggested that we visit you once more. Uh, you remember my assistant, Herbert Thompson? Yes, yes. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> hmm. Mr. Benny, we hate to bother you again, and the only reason we continue to do so is because we're trying to help you. I know, I know. <laughs> now, uh, you stated, Mr. Benny, <laughs> you stated that you made $375,000 last year. Yeah. And we're willing to assume that all you spent for entertainment was $17. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But now we've gone into your tax return further, and we feel there are other places you didn't take deductions you were entitled to. Really? Yes. Yes, we noticed, we noticed you prepared your income tax return yourself. Now, when it comes to filling out a return as complicated as yours, you're entitled to the services of an expert accountant a person who knows more about money matters than you do. <laughs> Name one. <laughs> well, offhand, that would be difficult. Yeah. Uh, now, Mr. Benny, believe me, we're trying to help you. I know, I know. <laughs> now, you listed an item of a $50,000 loan with a California bank. That's right, the, the California bank. Well, you know you can deduct the interest you pay on that loan. Oh, no, I can't. You see, I loaned it to them. <laughs> oh. Now, will there be anything else, gentlemen? No, I guess not. Come on, Herb, let's go back to the sanitarium and work on it some more. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. <laughs> Gee, but those two fellas are nice to me. Oh, Jack. Yes, Mary. The boys from the Beverly Hills Beavers are here. They came in the back way. Oh. Hello, boys. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hi, Mr. Benny. We're all ready to go. Yeah, let's go to the circus. All right, well... Hey, wait a minute, boys. Where's Stevie? He was supposed to come with us, too. He couldn't come. His mother's in the hospital. Oh, and Stevie's going to visit his mother today? No, they won't let him see her yet. Why, has she got something contagious? I don't think so. She's gonna have a baby. <laughs> oh, oh. That's what makes me think parents are so unfair. Well, what do you mean, unfair? Well, last summer, Stevie brought home a dog, and his mother and father wouldn't let him have it because he didn't ask their permission. Yeah, and now they're having a baby, and they didn't ask Stevie nothing about it. <laughs> Well, maybe we better drop the subject. Yeah. I can explain it, boys. You Dennis, shut up! <laughs> now, come on. Come on, we're all going to the circus. <laughs> Kids, let's all stick close together. I don't want anybody getting lost in the crowd. I'm holding Mrs. Livingston's hand. Good. And I'm holding Dennis Day's hand. Fine. And I'm holding your hand, Dawa Day. <laughs> yeah, don't be funny. Hiya, 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 hiya. The world's greatest attractions ever assembled in one place. Now, folks, we have Jojo the dog face boy. Beatrice, the marinated mermaid. Half herring, half sour cream. <laughs> And as an extra added attraction, we have the world's only India rubber man with white sidewall legs. <laughs> yes, sir, the greatest freaks on earth. Gosh. Mr. Benny, can we go in? I guess so. Oh, mister, about the freak show. Yes, sir, would you like a ticket or a contract? <laughs> All right, step right up. Now, now look, see, mister. Get away from me, bump your bottom me. <laughs> 
Mr. Benny? Quiet. Now, come on, kids. Hey, here's another sideshow. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right in and see the most amazing sights in the history of show business. On the inside, you'll see Matilda, the fat lady. 790 pounds of bounce and blubber. <laughs> And now, I want to call your attention to my colleague who will present the free show right here on the outside. Good, good. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, here is the free show. Look, Mary, it's Don. Hey, Don, Don. Get away from me, bud. You bother me. <laughs> huh? And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to present the eighth wonder of the world, the only singing monkeys in captivity. Take it, champs. Said the monkey to the chimp. All night long they chatter away. All day long they were happy and gay, swinging and singing in a honky tonky way. Dabba means luckies we love you. Dabba in monkey talk means you will love them too. They're a big attraction anywhere, a circus or the county fair. There's nothing quite like popping on a monkey's night. And that's so monkey shine When they see you puffing away On a lucky, happy and gay Smoking, yes, smoking This is what they have to say Means LSMFT In any talk means that's a smoke for me We're not monkeys, that you know We're Jack Sportet and me the dough the big free outside exhibition. But don't go away. Look here, look here, look here. I call your attention to this lady here, Salome, the exotic dancer of the Orient. She'll give her full and complete dance on the inside. The dance which caused sultans to give up their harems, rajas to fight duels. She shimmies and she shakes. Come on, kid, let's go over to the merry-go-round. Are you kidding? <laughs> Mr. Benny is right. Let's go to the merry-go-round. Come on, everybody. Hey, where's Dennis? I don't know. I haven't seen him. Oh, here he comes now. For heaven's sake, Dennis, where have you been? Oh, I've been going through the tunnel of love. <laughs> I don't know why everybody raves about it. It's awful. What's so bad about the tunnel of love? Oh, it's dark in there and lonesome and you get your clothes all wet. You got your clothes all wet? Why, did the boat leak? Oh, boat! <laughs> Jackson, hey Jackson, let's go see the wild animals. Yeah, yeah. Okay, come on, kids. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call your attention to Rex. Rex, the king of the jungle, the most ferocious lion in captivity. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> He must have a cold. He sneezed when he was a bird, too. <laughs> oh, well. And now, now we would like to call your attention to the world's most perfectly trained seal. <laughs> Friends, this extraordinary seal will now demonstrate his musical talent by playing Yankee Doodle on this horn. <laughs> Say, Phil, how about... I tried to get him from my bed, but he ain't union. <laughs> oh. Anyway, how would a seal look sitting up there with my band? Better than what you've got. Oh. <laughs> and it won't look so ridiculous when you throw them a fish. <laughs> Believe me. And now, friends, if you'll watch the centurine closely, we'll go on with the performance. Gee, it sure has 
been exciting here at the circus. Yeah, I'll say it was. And now, friends, before concluding today's performance, I'd like to present a final extra added attraction. In the middle of the center ring, we have the most ferocious gorilla in captivity. <laughs> tonight, friends, tonight, the management of this circus will offer this sum of $500 to anyone who will wrestle with this gorilla. Is there a volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> think of it, friends, think of it. $500 to anyone who will come up and wrestle with this gorilla. I wish Babe were here. <laughs> Babe? Our friends, this is your last chance, your last chance. To anyone, anyone who will wrestle this gorilla, I offer five hundred dollars. Well, hey Jackson, come back. Kid. <laughs> Wait for me, kids. They shouldn't take long. Jack, Jack. <laughs> All right, gorilla, put up your do. <laughs> hey, take it easy. I got a cold. <laughs> I know, but we got to make it look good. Okay, but don't pull the fur on my lip. That's real. <laughs> I will. Come on, let's wrestle. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one tiny burning ember from a campfire, a lighted and discarded match or cigarette left to smolder or thrown from a car window can cause a destructive forest fire. So no matter where you go, do your part to prevent forest fires that destroy millions of acres of timberland, cripple watersheds, and blast our natural resources that are so urgently needed now. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Thank you. Now, friends, let's visit some folks who are doing their spring planting. I've got my hoe, I've got my rake, I guess I'm really set. I've even got a better tasting Lucky cigarette. Mmm, you bet. Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. I planted peas and beans and corn, but oh, my aching back. Thank goodness for the mild, rich taste inside my Lucky pack. Try them, you'll agree. Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky, strike, be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. Friends, be happy, go lucky has a really important meaning for you because luckies taste better than any other cigarette. Yes, every lucky you light always gives you mildness, smoothness, far better taste than any other cigarette you've ever smoked. And here's why. Fine tobacco, and only fine tobacco can give you the enjoyment of a better tasting cigarette. And LSMFT, Lucky Strike, means fine tobacco. So for complete smoking enjoyment, be happy, go lucky. Make your next carton Lucky Strike. You'll find Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. Remember, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Gee, Jack, I never realized you were that brave. Imagine wrestling a gorilla. And you threw him in only 30 seconds. You knocked him flat. And he didn't even hurt you. Yeah, but I think I caught his cold. <laughs> Good night, folks. Be sure to hear Dennis Day in the day in the life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned for the Amos and Andy show, which follows immediately. The Jack Benny program is heard by our armed forces overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. 73 years ago, April 22nd, 1951, the Jack Benny program. Jack was on at 7, Amos and Andy at 7.30, but they also had a great lead-in, and that came from the show that follows, Eve Arden and our Miss Brooks. That's next, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Less than 3% of the population were in towns of more than 10,000. Most immigrants lived on the land, but cities were beginning to flourish. Revolutionary Philadelphia, with its 40,000 inhabitants, was the first colonial city in size. New York was second with 25,000. Boston with 16,000, third. Charleston, the largest city of the South, numbered 12,000. America was growing. 
And in spite of all adversity, America was destined to continue its growth. Why? Possibly because America was a dream for freedom-loving people, then as it is today. Tomorrow on our Tuesday edition, we will have drama with uh, an episode of The 13th Juror. Uh, that, ep- that show stars Vincent Price, also Pat Novak for Hire, Bulldog Drummond and The Dinner of Death, and uh, Nick Carter, Master Detective, and another episode of Superman. Uh, let's get on as we wrap up our look back at Sunday, April 22nd, 1951, with the uh, leadoff show. For the preceding two shows, and that would be Eve Arden and our Miss Brooks. She ran at 6.30 Eastern Time. And this show from 73 years ago, April 22nd, 1951, shows that things are uh, innovating. School gets a TV set. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. And Palm Olive Shave Creams for a smoother, more comfortable way to shave bring you our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks under the direction of Al Lewis. Well, whenever the routine at Madison High School is disturbed in any way, Principal Osgood Conklin registers serious objections, and he usually blames Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English there, for the disturbance. But the latest upheaval in Madison's schedule was definitely not my fault. Two weeks ago, the Board of Education put a television set into the school to see if its cultural and educational programs would enhance our regular curriculum. Last Thursday at breakfast, I discussed it with my landlady. What effect has the television set had so far? Well, Miss Fitzgerald, who conducts the TV group an hour a day, says there's one very marked result, Mrs. Davis. In just two weeks? That's right. There isn't a student at Madison who can't tell the difference between a Pinto and a Palomino at one glance. (laughs) They do have a great many cowboy films on, don't they? I would say so, yes. (laughs) But there are quite a few murder mysteries on, too, and some splendid horror films. (laughs) But, Connie... The board placed the set in the school for its scholastic value. Don't they televise any truly educational programs? Oh, I suppose so, Mrs. Davis. They had a semi-educational program on yesterday. Semi-educational? Yes, I think it was called The Batman Eats Up the Dean of Harvard. (laughs) Well, I'm sure they'll have more and more cultural things to look at as time goes by. Oh, that reminds me, Connie. It's been some time since that letter came for you. Did you get it? Letter? No, I didn't get any letter. Oh, me and that absent mind of mine. And I purposely put it where we couldn't overlook it. On your plate. My plate? Oh, dear. (laughs) How much of your eggs have you eaten? (laughs) Every bit but this blue part with the black line stamped (laughs) on it. Here's the letter, all right. Uh Uh-oh. It's another letter from the collection agency. The collection agency? Yes. Sherry's department store has put their delinquent accounts into the hands of the Coulter Collection Agency. It seems I've owed Sherry's about $25 for my Easter shopping. You mean they're making all this fuss at Sherry's because you haven't paid them since Easter? Easter 1945. (laughs) (laughs) What does the letter say? It says that I've either got to pay the money at once or they'll notify my employer and attach my salary. Oh, this is terrible. You know how Mr. Conklin feels about anyone who gets into debt. I wish I could help you, Connie, but the only money I've got is what you owe me for back rent. (laughs) Oh, I wouldn't want you to dig into that. (laughs) Well, I've got to be leaving for school and maybe someone there could lend me some money. How about Mr. Boynton? Mr. Boynton? Yes, he might have something saved up. He should. He's a bachelor. (laughs) Don't rub it in. (laughs) Of course, I kind of hate to ask him for a loan. Oh, nonsense, Connie. I'm sure he'll be happy to help you. He'll probably hand you $25 before you've even finished asking for it. It'll take longer than that to open his money belt. Wait up, 
Miss Brooks. I'd like to chin with you for a spell. <laughs> oh, it's me, Tex Martin. Oh, for a second there, I thought the television set came out in the hall. <laughs> I've been hearing a lot about this here television. I, I gotta get me a look at some of that stuff. A mirror is cheaper. <laughs> I don't like to rush you, Tex, but I'm really... The reason I stopped you, Miss Brooks, I, I wanted to tell you Mr. Boynton's looking for you. Mr. Boynton? Yeah, he seems right fond of you, ma'am. It, with no intention of sounding forward or personal, I'd like to say that I think the man who gets his brand on you is a mighty lucky hombre. Well, thank you, Tex. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to the biology lab and get some branding irons in the fire. <laughs> well, Miss Brooks, come on in. Oh, thanks, Mr. Boynton. What is it you wanted to see me about? Well, it's, uh... uh Miss Brooks, for over four years now, you and I have been, well, friends. <laughs> Don't rub it in. <laughs> Of course we've been friends. Well, it's, it's very difficult for me to have to do this, Miss Brooks, but I, I'd like to ask a favor of you. Now, that's a coincidence. I have a favor to ask of you, too. Really? Well, that makes it easier for me to ask mine. Miss Brooks? Yes, Mr. Boynton? Can you lend me $25? <laughs> $25? <laughs> well, I don't like to flaunt my erudition, Mr. Boynton, but you ain't heard no coincidences yet. <laughs> I came in here to borrow $25 from you. What? I got a letter from a collection agency this morning. A uh, collection agency? The, the Coulter Collection Agency? Yes. Do you take from them, too? <laughs> they wrote me a letter saying they'd notify my employer if I didn't pay them $25 at once. Was yours an overdue charge from Sherry's? Well, yes. I bought some presents for my twin nephews, Mike and Danny, on their fifth birthday. And Sherry's is making all this fuss because you haven't paid for them yet? Well, the twins were nine on Friday. <laughs> I wanted to pay this bill, but I just haven't been able to. Neither have I. And if Mr. Conklin finds out from the agency that... Wait a minute, I've got an idea. Oh, well, what is it? I'm going to tell Mr. Conklin about my predicament myself. For the honor of the school, he might advance me the money. Well, do you think he'd do the same for me? Well, it's worth a try. I'll tackle him first, then you can have a whack at him after lunch. That sounds pretty dangerous to me, Miss Brooks. Do you really think you ought to take the bull by the horns? Certainly. And I can see the headline now. Girl Toreador tossed into the bleachers. <laughs> Come in. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Conklin. I don't like to disturb you, Let's but... Let's not start the day with half-truths, Miss Brooks. <laughs> what do you want? Well, sir, it's like this. I... is. Uh, do you mind if I open the window? The window? Just the width of a human body. It's quite comfortable in this office. Now, get to the point, please. All right, I will. I need $25 to pay a delinquent bill I owe at Sherry's department store because they've turned it over to a collection agency which wrote me a letter saying that if I don't pay it promptly, they'll take it up with you. And as small as it is, I've grown too attached to my salary to have it attached. I thank you. What? <laughs> Am I to understand that one of my teachers is in the hands of a collection agency? $25 worth of me is. I wanted to pay it, sir, but what I... What a deplorable state of affairs. Obviously, your self-indulgence and mismanagement have brought you to this sorry plight. Yes, sir. But if I can just get some help this I one time... I suppose I'll have to do something about the situation. If the Board of Education ever found out about this, it would really reflect not only on you, but on your school and its principal as well. Naturally, I don't want any skeletons in Madison's closet. Oh, you're so right, Mr. Conklin. It's terrifying enough around here without that. <laughs> Who is it? I'm from the Coler Collection Agency. Oops, he's here already. What should I do, Mr. Conklin? Where can I go? Now, calm down, Miss Brooks. One moment, please. I'll handle this matter. You go into my inner office and wait there until I call you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Come in. My name is uh, Gray, William Gray. I'm with the Coulter Collection Agency. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Gray? 
I presume you're here in regard to a debt of one of Madison's teachers? Uh, no, I'm here in regard to a debt of one Osgood Conklin. <laughs> Osgood Conklin? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm new in this town and haven't had much of a chance to get acquainted. Uh, Sherry's department store tells me he owes them $50 since 1948. Uh, could you help me find Mr. Conklin? What? What kind of a looking fellow is he? <laughs> Have you any idea? Well, uh, he was described to me as a dumpy sort of chap. <laughs> uh, thinning hair and a mustache that looks like an unkept lawn. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why, there's no such person in this vicinity. Although, come to think of it, there was an Osgood Conklin employed here four or five years ago. I believe he was the school custodian. <laughs> the one I have in mind is the principal of this school. The principal? Now? Yes. And if you happen to hear from him, would you be kind enough to inform him that unless he pays the $50 he owes by this afternoon, we will notify the Board of Education and take steps to attach his salary. But you can't do the... Uh, uh, that is, I'll be happy to inform the gentleman this way. <laughs> now, as the new school custodian, I'm quite busy, so if you'll excuse me, I'd like yes, to... Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, thank you for your courtesy. That's quite all right. Good day, Mr. Gray. Good day, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> well, at least I'll have time. Good day, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Dad, he knows. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll think of something. Miss Brooks, you may come in now. Is he gone? Yes, yes, he's gone. Oh, by the way, you didn't happen to overhear any of our conversation, did you? Why, Mr. Conklin, you know there's a key in the keyhole. I mean, uh... <laughs> that inner office is practically soundproof. Good, good. Well, I can't possibly advance you any money, but in spite of your incompetence in managing your personal affairs... I put Mr. Gray off your trail, at least temporarily. Oh, thank you, sir. At least I can go to my first class in peace. Oh, don't mention it. But before you go, I think I would like the window opened after all. It got quite hot in here rather suddenly. Don't you think so, Miss Brooks? Yes, I do, Mr. Conklin. Especially for school custodians. <laughs> Brush your teeth with Colgate's Colgate Dental Cream. It cleans your breath. What a toothpaste. What cleans your teeth. Colgate toothpaste. Cleans your breath. What a toothpaste. What cleans your teeth. Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. And the Colgate way stops tooth decay best. Yes, the Colgate way is the most thoroughly proved and accepted home method of oral hygiene known today. Over two years' research showed brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helped stop more decay for more people than ever before reported in dentifrice history. The Colgate way stopped tooth decay best. No other dentifrice, ammoniated or not, offers such conclusive proof. And you should know that Colgate's, while not mentioned by name, was the only toothpaste used in the research on tooth decay recently reported in Reader's Digest. So always follow the Colgate way to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and stop tooth decay best. Brush your teeth with Colgate's Colgate Dental Cream. It cleans your breath while the toothpaste while it cleans your teeth. And the Colgate way stops tooth decay best. <laughs> Mr. Conklin was a charter member of the Bad Debt Club, along with Mr. Boynton and myself. We were all faced with the same dilemma, how to stall off the Colter Collection Agency before it took unpleasant action that afternoon. I was pondering this weighty problem in the school cafeteria at noon when Harriet Conklin and Walter Denton, two of my lesser problems, approached the table. Hi, Miss Brooks. Hello, Harriet. Walter. Greetings, most majestic mentor. <laughs> we kneel at your feet, oh gracious queen of the faculty. Arise, knight. <laughs> With this butter knife, I dub thee Sir Appetite. 
<laughs> Sit down and have some lunch, Walter. No, I just ate, Miss Brooks. Oh, come now. You can think of a better excuse than that. <laughs> down on our lunch these days, Miss Brooks. Why, Harriet? So we can enjoy the popcorn better when we watch television. <laughs> you have no idea how we enjoy the school set, Miss Brooks. Hey, it's a wonderful medium for education. Oh, now, just a minute, Walter. I've watched some of those shows. Do you call those Western movies educational? Well, certainly. Of course, it all depends on what an individual's looking for. Now, me, I watch them to learn about customs and manners of a great era and a great adventurous people. And Harriet, on the other hand, watches them for another reason. What does she want to learn? How to slide a glass of beer down a long bar? <laughs> well, there are some really legitimate educational programs shown, Miss Brooks. We just haven't been able to get them lately. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. <laughs> I suppose you kids do get something out of the television class. Oh, we do, Miss Brooks. Miss Fitzgerald is most helpful and constructive. She keeps the room in just the right degree of darkness to make the picture come out sharp and clear. As a matter of fact, Harriet and I are on our way to the television room right now. But, Walter, it's only 12.30. There's nothing permitted on television until the class at 2. I know. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Brooks. It's a great place to hold hands, Miss Brooks. You ought to drop in there with Mr. Boynton sometime. Oh, fine. <laughs> Little did I think in teacher's college that someday I'd be on the faculty at Lowe's Madison High. <laughs> Pardon me, Miss Brooks, but is this table occupied? No, Mr. Boynton. The occupation force has just left. <laughs> Sit down, won't you? Oh, thanks. Well, I haven't been able to get the money for the collection agency as yet, have you? No, I haven't. But we're not the only indigent faculty members at this school. Our principal owes a bill, too. You mean Mr. Conklin's in the same boat we are? He's not only in it, he's rocking it. <laughs> While I was in his office, I heard Mr. Gray from the agency threaten to expose Mr. Conklin to the Board of Education if he didn't pay up $50 by this afternoon. Why, that's terrible. <laughs> Tragic. <laughs> There must be some method whereby we, we could pacify the agency until we could pay up. In that way, maybe... Wait, I've got an idea. Maybe we could put up something as security. You know, temporary collateral. Collateral? Oh, but I haven't anything that's worth $25 with me, and even my watch. I know, it's in the same window as mine. <laughs> Oh, what we might be able to do is give them one item that might serve as security until we all pay up. Now, let's see now. Isn't there something right here at school that looks impressive but is completely unessential? Sure there is. But the collection agency would never accept Mr. Conklin as security. <laughs> oh, please, Miss Brooks. This is serious. Say, I know what might work. We'll offer them the school television set. So far, it's been most unessential. Oh, but it's not our property. It belongs to the board. We'll only be borrowing it, Mr. Boynton. And since we'll be helping Mr. Conklin out of a jam, too, he'll be sure to cooperate. Yes, the more I think about it, the more I like it. I'll call Mr. Gray and have him pick up the set immediately. But, Miss Brooks, are you sure Mr. Conklin will stand for this? Mr. Boynton, I'm positive. I can hardly wait to see his face when I tell him about it. I'll bet it turns absolutely human. <laughs> This is the office of Osgood Conklin, the principal of Madison High School, himself speaking. Isn't that nice? Well, this is himself, head of the Board of Education on this end. What? Mr. Stone, how nice to hear from you, sir. I was just saying to myself... You can tell me about it this to... afternoon, Conklin. I'm coming over to see how that television class is working in your school. The television class? But, Mr. Stone, are you sure this afternoon is convenient for you? Maybe some other we time... We went to considerable be... expense to install that set two weeks ago, and I've got to find out if the experiment is worth it. I'll see you in about an hour. Goodbye. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Stone. Oh, everything happens to me. I hope that collection agency fellow doesn't come snooping around this afternoon. He won't be back until tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, oh, come in. Mr. Conklin, I've got some delightful news for you. Really? 
When are you transferring? <laughs> Even better news than that, if that's possible. What I wanted to tell you, sir, was that I put up some security, and the collection agency isn't going to bother us again until we're ready to pay them back what we owe. Why, Miss Brooks, you have no idea what a relief this is to me. Just before you arrived, Mr. Stone called and said he was coming over this afternoon. It would have been terribly embarrassing if he'd run into that collection chap. Oh, it certainly would have. But if I say so myself, and who else is going to, I have successfully circumvented that catastrophe. Yes, sir, I just used the old noggin and... Mm, well, tell me, Miss Brooks, just how did you manage to stall them? Well, I simply called Mr. Gray and had him pick up the school television set. And in return for that, he agreed not to... You had him pick up what? <laughs> television set. You see, sir, I figured... Oh, God! <laughs> Miss Brooks, the reason Mr. Stone just called was to inform me that he's coming over this afternoon to witness the school set in operation. What? But he can't do that. I mean, we've got to do something. You've got to do something. <laughs> the author of the infamous plot just outlined to me, the responsibility for all further action rests with you and you alone. Yes, sir. Even while you were talking, the very tiniest mouse of an idea began nibbling at my brain. If I know you, Miss Brooks, he'll either starve to death in five minutes <laughs> or emerge as the most terrifying spectacle since the Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> Well, we're assured of the cooperation of the kids, Mr. Conklin. The rest is up to us. It's a desperate measure, Miss Brooks, but I'll do my part. Now, as I understand it, you are to remain here in my office to receive Mr. Stone, and I am to return in about five minutes. Correct. Believe me, Mr. Conklin, when Mr. Stone leaves here, he'll be delighted that our TV set is no longer on the premises. I'd like to believe you, Miss Brooks. And now, as I leave this office where I spent so many joyous years as Madison's <laughs> beloved dictator, a principal, <laughs> I can only say, as I open this door, that if I am about to walk into the shadow of unemployment, I shall not walk alone. Isn't he sweet? <laughs> oh, give me a home. Come in. Good afternoon, Miss Brooks. Is Mr. Conklin in? No, sir. Now, where is he? Well, I can't rightly say. <laughs> he just sort of took off like a big winged bird. <laughs> what? Most likely just mosey down the hall a piece. Come on in and sit, Mr. Stone. I'll chin with your spell. Chin with... Miss Brooks, do you realize you're talking to the head of the Board of Education? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Stone. It's just that I've been watching so much television since you had it installed at school that this here Western palaver comes right natural to me. That set was installed for strictly cultural purposes. And that's the way it's been used. It's already tied and branded most of the young'uns here at Madison. The young'uns? <laughs> Pardon for busting in, Miss Brooks, but have you seen anything of my pappy? <laughs> Nary hide nor hair, Harry. <laughs> but you haven't said howdy to Mr. Stone, gal. Mr. Stone, you know Harriet Conklin. I used to. <laughs> howdy, Mr. Stone. Right nice to meet up with you again. Now, who's she supposed to be? Calamity Jane? <laughs> Why does everybody spend so much attention to Westerns? As far as I'm concerned, they're nothing Hold but... Hold on there, Mr. Stone. That kind of palaver don't go in these parts. What's that? You was about to say a discouraging word. <laughs> I'll say more than that. Excuse me, folks. The door was open, so I thought I'd just lope on here. <laughs> 
I don't believe at all. Well, now, this is Tex Barton. Tex, this is Mr. Stone from the Board of Education. Well, if and he's a friend of yours, Miss Brooks, he's a friend of mine, no matter where he's from. Now, see here, this farce has gone far enough. Why are you talking in this manner, boy? I don't know no other way. <laughs> How long have you been speaking with this, this Western drawl? Well, I've been talking this way since I was ankle high to the drooping fetlock of a stunted pindo. <laughs> lower than that, unless you're driving a submarine. He can't have always talked this way. Television isn't that old. With him, it's standard equipment, Mr. Stone. I don't get this. Does everyone at Madison want to be a cowboy? Oh, no, sir. Several of them have expressed a desire to be Indians. When this TV proposition was broached... Mr. Stone. Oh, there you are, Conklin. Uh, sorry I'm late. Now, I guess you must think I'm a pretty ornery maverick. Ornery maverick? Why, sure. <laughs> to go and traipse in off while you're squatting on your haunches in my corral? Oh, for heaven's sakes, not you, too. Mr. Conklin's watched television very closely. Yeah, I I've observed it thoroughly, partner. I mean, Mr. Stone. All I can say is the influence it's had on this particular school is positively abysmal. Oh, I agree. Yeah, what you said. That, that's why I took the liberty of making a rather radical decision today. Mr. Stone, what would you say if I told you that the television set was no longer with us? I'd say good riddance, Osgood. Splendid. You would? In that case, I must, with humble pride, accept your congratulations, sir. The set is off these premises. And as I would have taken full censure, so must I take full credit for its going. Huh? In its concept from the beginning, this action taken for the good of the school was my doing and mine alone. And I know Miss Brooks will be the first to bear me out. Definitely. How do you want to go? Head first or feet first? Our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... You get smoother, more comfortable, comfortable shaves by shaving the palm olive brushless way. Yes, smoother, more comfortable, comfortable shaves the palm olive brushless way. Boom. Hey, that's a fact, men. You can get smoother, yes, more comfortable shaves the palm olive brushless shaving cream way. Just rub velvet smooth palm olive brushless into your beard. You'll find it wilts the toughest whiskers. It actually protects your skin by providing a soft film that floats your razor's cutting edge. Remember, over 1,200 men tested the palm olive brushless shaving cream way following directions on the package. And no matter how they shaved before, three out of four reported beards easier to cut, less razor pull, smoother, more comfortable... Yes, more comfortable shaves. So, men, try the palm olive brushless way yourself. Even in cold or hard water, you get a close, clean shave. And a smoother, more comfortable, yes, a more comfortable shave. You get smoother, more comfortable, comfortable shaves the palm olive brushless way. Boom. Next time you shave, try the palm olive brushless shaving cream way. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, as soon as Mr. Stone and the others had left his office, Mr. Conklin admitted that he was grateful for my assistance. Then, in the manner so typical of the man, he immediately conferred upon me my reward. Miss Brooks, in appreciation for your meritorious service, I have decided to bestow a rare honor upon you. You will be permitted to type up in triplicate six copies of my latest report to the superintendent of schools. <laughs> And have it on my desk tomorrow morning. 
Miss Brooks, you haven't answered me. Where are you going? I'm going to head them off at the pass. It's the only way to save the fort. <laughs> For another Our Miss Brooks show, brought to you by Palmolive Shave Cream for a smoother, more comfortable way to shave, and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written by Al Lewis and Arthur Allsberg, with the music of Wilbur Hatch. <laughs> And from April 22nd, 1951, Eve Arden, our Miss Brooks, wrapping up our salute to Sunday, April 22nd, 1951, 73 years ago. Up next, we'll go back to uh, April 22nd, 1947, the Tuesday, and see what's going on at the Wistful Vista Carnival with Bibber, McGee, and Molly. That best wish is peace on earth. Much of Reynolds' expanding aluminum production now goes to the defense of the nation, the defense of our free world. But the ultimate aim is peace, always. And the great destiny of light, strong, rust-proof Reynolds aluminum lies in peaceful progress. The Reynolds Metals Company looks forward to the day when all aluminum production can be turned to constructive uses. In a future when the inspired hope of Christmas shall be realized. And on Earth... Peace, goodwill toward men. And we'll get back to Waxy in just a moment with an episode of Fibber McGee and Molly from 77 years ago, April 22nd, 1947, as they visit the carnival. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax products for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly with Bill Thompson, Gail Gordon, Arthur Q. Bryan, Gene Carroll, and me, Harlow Wilcox. The script is by Don Quinn and Phil Leslie. Music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. We were especially pleased recently when a listener who has kept house for 34 years told us how supremely satisfied she is with the way Johnson's cream wax both cleans and beautifies her furniture and woodwork. Now, of course, if you're one of the millions of enthusiastic women who use this newest Johnson's wax polish, you know yourself that cream wax really is in a class by itself. You see, besides protective Johnson's wax, cream wax contains two very effective cleansing ingredients. When you apply it to your furniture and woodwork, it fairly whisks away dirt and fingerprints. Buff lightly, and Johnson's Cream Wax gives a richly polished wax luster that glows with beauty. After that, future cleaning is easy. Dust and dirt won't cling to the hard, smooth finish because Cream Wax contains no oil. Just an occasional dusting keeps your wood surfaces and white kitchen equipment satin smooth and sparkling. Take a tip from me and try Johnson's Cream Wax. It's wonderful. <laughs> Molly McGee of 79 Wistful Vista thinks a carnival is a legitimate source of fun and frolic. Mr. McGee thinks a carnival is strictly a one-ring circus where the monkeys pay to get in, and the only reservations you can make are mental. The debate is still going on as we join Fibber McGee and Molly. Where is this carnival you want to go to? This one-night yokel trap? It's at 14th and Oak. It's a vacant lot. And so are the people who go to it. (laughs) Well, I don't care. I love carnivals and I want to go. Ah, forget it, kiddo. That stuff is for rubes, not for sophisticated people like I and you. (laughs) Nonsense. Heavenly days back in Peoria, you took me to all the carnivals and nobody hooped and hollered any louder than you did. Well, I was young and stupid in those days. I see. But I'm not young anymore. (laughs) I know the angles now. Let them grifters find a new crop of dough heads. (laughs) 
Just what don't you like about carnivals anymore? I don't like anything about them. I can stand in front of the Third National Bank and see more fat ladies, human skeletons, <laughs> wild men, and two-headed vice presidents in 20 minutes than a carnival could round up in 40 years. <laughs> Dearie. I can hear better music listening to a flat wheel streetcar hitting a switch. Well, I don't I know. I can make better pink lemonade out of faucet water. <laughs> and I can dance a better hoochamacooch and hip boots than any Hawaiian girl from Milwaukee. They got their whole underpaid payroll. <laughs> yes, but McGee. I've popped sweeter corn in vaudeville than those mugs ever tasted. And got more interesting souvenirs falling into a coal hole. <laughs> All right. Let's stay home. No, sir. What? Get your hat. I wouldn't miss this carnival for all the ham in Hollywood. But I thought you didn't like carnivals. I hate them. And I'm not going to sit here and let those sharpshooters think they can keep me from enjoying myself. <laughs> Besides, I want to prove something to you. You already have. Huh? You've just proved that you can't win an argument even from yourself. Just the same, I want to prove to you what a racket them carnival concessions are. Come on, let's go. All right, but I'd better tell Lena we're going out so she can spend the rest of the afternoon trying on my dresses. <laughs> Lena! Oh, Lena! Here I am, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> <laughs> and unless you bought some new clothes in the last week, I've tried them all on. You know, that black taffeta of yours is just simply gorgeous on me. And if you see any lipstick on the mirror, it's because I just couldn't resist myself. <laughs> Look, Lena, we're going downtown to the carnival, so you're on your own for the afternoon. Uh, we no doubt will not be home for dinner, Lena, so when you finish your work and get through reading my mail, you can go home. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, honey. And I hope you have a good time. You know, carnivals are such fun. I used to work in one snake charmer, you know. <laughs> Heavenly days. You were a snake charmer, Lena? Yes, I was called Roberta the Reptile Wrestler. <laughs> I used to sing to the little fellas to keep them quiet. That's why I don't mind it when people hiss at me now. <laughs> Ever get bit, Lena? Yes, I did, Mr. McGee. You know, I tied a rattlesnake into too hard a knot once, and he got mad at me and bit me right on the elbow. <laughs> My goodness, I thought a rattlesnake bite was fatal, Lena. Oh, it was, honey. He died in horrible agony. <laughs> You know, it was a valuable snake, so they put me in another sideshow as a bearded lady. Oh, false beard, eh? Well, hardly, Mr. Meeky. You can hardly call a beard that costs twelve dollars and a half a false one. <laughs> <laughs> you really take it on the chin in that work, don't you, Lena? <laughs> yeah. Why'd you give up your job as bearded lady, Lena? Well, they moved the train fleas into the same tent, Mr. McGee, and I guess I just had too much insect appeal. <laughs> Now you go right down to the carnival, folks. Lena will get along just as soon as you leave, practically. Yeah. Well, there's one thing about Lena McGee. She's always cheerful. Yeah, she's that all right. I'd rather have somebody around who smiles and makes the beds badly than a marvel of efficiency who punches the clock with the left hook. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of left hook, Snooky, wait till you see me take that big mallet and ring that big gong down at that big conga. I thought you said it was rigged up so you couldn't win on it's it. It's rigged up against the yokels, baby. You can take those guys if you're hep to the gimmicks. Come on, let's get going. Oh, I don't know, dearie. Maybe it's just too corny. Oh, come on. Carnivals are fun. You'll enjoy it. Kind of a jip, aren't they? Oh, what if they are? My gosh, it's all in fun. What makes you so suspicious? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I've just heard people talk. Well, that's a lot of marmalade. I love carnivals. Hey, I think I'll wear a hat. I might win a ribbon that says 23 Skidoo on it, huh? Where's my hat? I don't know. The last time I... Oh, I know. It's right here in the hall closet. You oh. No, no, hall. McGee, please. Now, that hall closet... <laughs> Billy Mills in the orchestra and Little Rock Getaway.
Cracker Jack so fast? I'm trying to get down to the price. <laughs> Got a wonderful little police whistle in this stuff once when I was a kid. My dog swallowed it. Oh, too bad. Oh, he loved it. He used to direct traffic every noon hour at the corner of Main and Avenue. <laughs> back in Peoria. <laughs> Look, dearie, I want to play this game over here where you ring the canes and win the prize. All right, all right, all right. Step right up and throw the magic rings for a beautiful and valuable souvenir. It's fair for one and fair for all. Entertaining, instructive, and profitable. Only 25 cents, the fourth part of a dollar. I'll try it, sir. Good for you, sister. Good for you. See if you can ring one of those genuine South American diamond lapel pins or a real Navajo blanket. Navajo, bud. Yeah. Well, we know it was Navajo, but we don't know who. <laughs> All right, lady, here's your magic ring. Step back, folks, and give the little lady some elbow room. Take my advice, kiddo, and give it a little twist when you throw it. I throw better with my eyes shut, dearie. Here it goes. Hello, oh, hey, look, hey, look, hey, look, hey, little lady done it. With one graceful toss, she wins a handsome three-bladed jackknife bearing a likeness of Lillian Russell in genuine celluloid on the hand. Let's go to the end, lady. Let's see if you can win the opera glasses, Molly. There's a new corset shop just went in across the street from the Elks Club, and some of the boys... <laughs> Pop and give the lady a chance to throw the ring. And don't call me Pop. Okay, Dad, no offense intended. <laughs> That's it. Go right ahead, lady. Is it fair if I throw both these other rings at once? Madam, with a hackett and sackett compound outdoor shows, the customer is always right. We're just here to hand out these beautiful gifts and make friends among the local gentry. <laughs> yes, sir, just throw them any way you like. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh. Oh, hey, hey, hey. My gosh, look what you did, Why, kid. Yes, sir, the little lady does it again. With one magnificent throw, she becomes automatically entitled to a genuine Navajo blanket and a lovely mother-of-pearl paper knife. Hey, you all, lady. Uh, thank you very much. My goodness, this is wonderful. Hey, bud, what do you mean, mother-of-pearl paper knife? That's just made out of white pine. Yes, sir, genuine white pine, brother. Made by my wife's mother. Her... Tell your mother to step out here. <laughs> step out to show this gentleman how she calls these gorgeous oh. little souvenirs. And now, who else would like to step up and try one of the finest? You know, this is not a bad start, dearie. 25 cents for a blanket, a jackknife, and a paper cutter. Oh, they let you in just for bait. I saw the guy put his foot on the gimmick. He was just using you for a shill. What's a shill? It's a come on for the boobs. I know, because I used to be one. <laughs> A boob? No, a shill. <laughs> Guy was running a shill game and he hired me to shell. Oh, hey, there's Wimple. Hi, Wimple. Hello, Mr. Wimple. Hello, folks. <laughs> hey, isn't this fun, though? Don't you just love carnival? No. <laughs> They're okay if you can get yourself into a state of yokel wonder, Wimp. Personally, I'm a little too intelligent for this sort of thing. Oh, not me, Mr. Wimple. I'm just dumb enough to enjoy it. <laughs> me too, Mrs. McGee. I've just had the most exciting time with the archery game this afternoon. We haven't tried that one yet. How many arrows did you shoot, Wimp? Three. Ooh. I put two arrows in the bullseye and one in the proprietor. <laughs> Did you two ever see a man jump clear over a carnival tent from a standing start? <laughs> My goodness, did he jump that high when you hit him, Mr. Wimple? No, I did, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't break my balloon. <laughs> you seem to be having quite a gay time, Wimp, jumping over tents and buying balloons. Full of helium, eh? I beg your pardon. <laughs> I've only had three lemonades and a root beer. <laughs> a short one. He meant the balloon, Mr. Wimple. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> I am having a gay time, though, really. I guess I must just have sawdust in my blood. Yeah. I'm bothered with corpuscles myself. <laughs> well, I must get over and see Sweetie Face. That's my big old wife. Yeah. <laughs> She's in that brown tent across the midway there. Which brown tent? The one that says... $50 to any person who can last three rounds with the Amazon Strangler. Heavenly days, Mr. Wimple. You mean she's actually going into the ring with the Amazon Strangler? No. <laughs> you see, <laughs> she is the Amazon Strangler. <laughs> well, I've got to get over there and see if anybody has beaten her yet. I hope. <clears throat> so long. See you later, man.
to see if I can win something on the raffle wheel. Oh, what do you want to play that game for? That thing is All so... All right, folks, plenty of numbers left. Pick your lucky digit and win a beautiful abalone lamp or a box of Lowney's chocolates. A prize for every number and a number for every customer, and it's only 25 cents a chance. What's your lucky number, lady? Well, I've always liked number 13 because one and three are four, and my husband used to sing in a quartet. <laughs> Very logical reasoning, madam. All right, folks, the wheel is about to spin, and here we go. Round and round and round she whirls for the handsome men and the pretty girls. And the arrow points to number... number 13. Oh, my! Heavenly days, I did it again. What did I tell you? It's fixed. He knew I was on to him, so he let you win. Well, if they keep on being as crooked as this, I'll win every prize in the place. Uh, What did I win, sir? Girlie, you are the lucky winner of a genuine abalone shell table lamp with a two-way bulb, adjustable shade, and only 13 inches of cord for convenience in carrying. (laughs) Here you are. Now then, the wheel is about to spin again. Who'll be the next lucky? It's a lucky thing you're with a guy that knows the answers to this stuff, Snooky. Those birds aren't going to try and monkey business with a wise guy like me around. I'm strictly the type... Oh, hey, look. Isn't that Wilcox over there? Where? Over there, talking to the big guy in the ticket wagon. Come on. Hey, Junior. Hi, Hello, Junior. Mr. Wilcox. Hello, Molly, pal. Uh, excuse me a minute, will you? You go right ahead, Mr. Wilcox. And uh, like I say, Mr. Hackett, you'll be amazed and delighted at the way Johnson's self-polishing glow coat works on your linoleum. Linoleum? Yes, yes. Glow coat gives it a gleaming finish. Who's got linoleum? <laughs> Why, uh, well, uh, you see... Look at Wilcox getting slowed down, Molly. Well, even if you don't have linoleum, Mr. Hackett, you, you'll find glow coat the quickest and most efficient method of keeping your floors bright and shining and sparkling. Floors. <laughs> Why, uh, yeah, yes, you see, one of the nice things about Johnson's self-polishing glow coat is the fact that it's so easy to apply. You simply pour a little out, spread it around with a long-handled applier, and let it dry in 20 minutes or less to a handsome, gleaming finish that any housekeeper will be proud of. Well, sounds fine, son, but I haven't got a housekeeper. Oh, my goodness. He is having trouble, isn't he? Yeah, watch him squirm, Molly. Well, uh... Naturally, Mr. Hackett, glow coat doesn't have to be handled by your housekeeper. A child could apply it. I simply meant that it'll be a wonderful aid in keeping your home clean and sparkling and beautiful. Who's got a home? (laughs) Well, uh, I... I don't mean to be rude, Mr. Wilcox, and that that stuff... uh... Uh, Glow coat. Johnson, self-polishing glow coat. Yeah, it sounds great. Uh, look, I live in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> Is it any good for tent floors? Uh, what kind of tent floors? Dirt. <laughs> and grass, if we're lucky. Uh, no. Gee, I never thought I'd... Well, gosh, Racine can't expect me to sell it. Well, anyway, it sounds great, son. Must be a fine product. Look, here's my car. Send some literature on it to my wife. She lives in East Orange, New Jersey, in a house. She's got linoleum, I think. <laughs> Haven't seen her for two years. She don't like the road. <laughs> okay, Mr. Haggard, thanks very much. I'll write to her tonight. Well, hello, Molly. Hi, Feber. Fine carnival, isn't it, Mr. Wilcox? <laughs> Look what we won already, Waxy. An apple hoop blanket, a jackknife, an apple only lamp, and a paper cutter. One buck for the lot. Great. I won one of those lamps out here yesterday. Has it really got a two-way bulb in it? Absolutely. Two- goes on, it goes off. <laughs> Well, I've got to get back to work, folks. I'll see you later. Look, Mr. Wilcox, if you're going this way, help me load some of this stuff in our car, will sure, you? Sure, sure, sure. Let me take it, Mom. I'll be waiting right here, Mom. All right, McGee. Now, don't win anything else unless I approve of it first. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilcox. Ah, there goes a good kid. I have more fun spending quarters on her out here than I'd have spending 50 bucks on anybody else. Or her, either. Oh, hey, she forgot to take this blanket. Oh, well, maybe she'll be... Hi, there. mister. Oh, hi, Deanie. <laughs> well, fancy meeting you here, isn't it? <laughs> Hmm? You having fun, sis? Sure I am, I betcha. Mm-hmm. I had some popcorn and some Cracker Jack and some peanuts and three ice cream combs and some cotton candy and some saltwater taffy and two stomach aches. <laughs> you did, eh? And I have... <laughs> hmm? 
I says you did, eh? Did what? You had two tummy aches. I know it. Hey, hey, mister, look at... Hmm? Uh, can you ring the bell with the big mallet, mister? Hmm, can you? Did you ever try it, mister? Hmm, did you ever try it? Hmm, did you ever? Sis, I have won more cigars on that thing than my wife could and did shake a stick at. Shall we try it? Oh, hey, yeah. Matt, give us two chances on a cigar. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Here you are, sir. One for you and one for the little lady. The prize for men is a genuine Punxsutawney Panatella in the original Florida wrapper. If the little lady rings the gong, she gets a beautiful one-pound box of simulated chocolate-coated cherries. Here's the hammer, brother. Let's see now. Where did I put that hammer? Ah, uh, here it is. And uh, may you be the one for whom the bell tolls. Thanks, bud. I'll take it first, sis, and show you how it's done. Oh. Now watch this, Jeannie. Yeah. It's just a matter of muscular coordination. One, two, three. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> No use you trying it, sis. That weight is harder to get up than an actor on Monday. <laughs> I bet you I can do it. I bet you. Watch me. <laughs> My gosh, you did it, sis. Yeah, I did it. And the little lady wins a box of simulated chocolate-type imitation cherry-flavored cherry. <laughs> Here you are, kid. Oh, thank you, Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred! So long, mister. Well, the King's Men and Sawing a Woman in Half. When I was a youngster of seven or eight, I worshipped a hero, a man truly great. I'd stare open-eyed at this wonderful man as he took his place on the stage and began sawing a woman in half. I'd shiver and shake and I'd laugh. He'd show us a lady, I'm not telling fibs, a lady who had no regard for her ribs. He'd saw the poor girl into fractions and then the orchestra played until we meet again. What a whale of a trick, for did I get a kick out of sawing a woman in Right through the middle, the saw quickly goes <laughs> Until it had parted her head from her toes The crowd got excited when she was divided They stared and they strained every muscle They said it was magic, but I thought it tragic To sever her hat from her bustle And I don't mean maybe, if I was that baby I'd raise up a flock of objections The axe spoils her chance for a lovely romance Who'd marry a lady in sections Sawing a woman in two Was ever the right thing to do In decent society there should be a law To keep him from hacking her ribs with a saw To settle the question I asked for a date And when she said yes, I hardly could wait I wound up in trouble, my date was a double Cause he saw that woman in half. Well, we seem to keep winning things, McGee. Five canes, two cupid dolls, a basket of fruit, and a bowl of goldfish. Don't forget the brownie camera. That's the biggest jip prize we got. Why is it? Oh, my gosh, you can't take pictures of brownies. Everybody knows. Well, I oh, McGee, there's Dr. Gamble. You who, doctor? Well, hello there, Molly. Hello, Droopwell. Hi, Aerosmith. <laughs> what are you doing here, doctoring a sick horse on the merry-go-round? No, this is strictly a non-professional visit, my boy. Just came down here for a little riotous living. Oh, it's a lot of fun, doctor. McGee's been showing me how crooked all these concessions are. They know he's doing it, too, because I win every time. I'm wise to all their gimmicks. I'm no hayseed. Uh -huh. Hey, did you throw the baseballs at them milk bottles, Doc? I did indeed. Mm -hmm. I spent $4.75, and all I got was a bursitis. Hmm. We got an abalone lamp. <laughs> We're going to ride on the Ferris wheel, Doctor. Care to come along? No, thank you, my dear. Scared, eh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, but I'm just foolhardy, I guess. I'm so frightened of admitting I'm scared that I get so brave I'm frightened of my own courage. 
I'll straighten that out on the way home, if possible. <laughs> well, have fun, children, and don't eat too many hot dogs. But if you do, call some other doctor. I'm planning on being sick myself tonight. <laughs> See you later. So long, Ducky. Well, come on, Christy. We must ride on the Ferris wheel just once now, and then we'll go home. Well, you talk me into it, dearie. Well. McGee, I didn't realize it went this high. I hope it holds together till we get off. <laughs> they put this thing together with burnt matches and rubber bands. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, heavenly days, what was that? I think one of the rubber bands busted. <laughs> well, at least we got stuck up at the top where we can see things. I'm glad I don't walk in my sleep if we have to spend the night up here. <laughs> Spread that Navajo blanket over us, dear. It's getting cool. Okay. How's that? Very cozy. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah. Very exclusive up here, too. <laughs> Just us and a few clouds. <laughs> Remember the time this happened back in Peoria? We were marooned on top of the Ferris wheel for three hours. <laughs> I remember it very well, dearie. Yeah. We must have taken a dozen rides on it first. Yep. I'd begun to think that wheel never would break down. <laughs> <laughs> Me, too. I was running out of dough. <laughs> I know that <laughs> uh, That was the uh, first time you ever kissed me, remember? Yeah, yeah I was nervous <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what I was doing Are you nervous now? Not a bit, Snooky You know what you're doing? Yep Well? <laughs> well, Match. Hey, folks! You up on top there! What do you want, point killer? <laughs> don't worry, we'll have you down pretty quick. Why don't you mind your own business, Cy? That's telling him, lover. Have you noticed all the car owners these days out polishing up the old bus for summer? You'll be doing yours soon, I imagine. Well, don't forget that Johnson's Car and you'll do a wonderful job for you in less time and also save you a lot of unnecessary work. Car New not only makes even an old model car shine like new, it's really easy to use, too. It requires only a minimum of rubbing. You see, Johnson's Car New is a special liquid polish that does two jobs at once. It both cleans and polishes in just one application. You apply it, rubbing only hard enough to loosen the old surface dirt. Then you let it dry to a white powder. When you wipe off this powder, dull dirt and road grime go right along with it. Man, oh man, your car really shines. Why don't you try Car New? You and your family will get far more pleasure out of driving a clean, sparkling car. And when you do finally get that brand new model, you'll rate a better trade-in value. Car New is spelled C-A-R-N-U. Johnson's Car New. Okay, folks, you can hop out now. Oh, don't mind us, but we like it up here. And... Oh, oh, we're down. <laughs> and did you notice, Molly? We're down. Oh, dear. My <laughs> lipstick is all... I mean, my hair is all must and well, I... Well, relax, lady. So it's a spring evening and he looks handsome to you again. I've saw it happen before. <laughs> Good night, folks. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Products for Home and Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. And remember, daylight savings time goes into effect in certain areas next week. This may change the time at which Fibber McGee and Molly are heard in your community. So please check your local paper for the time at which this program will be heard next Tuesday night and each week thereafter. Good night. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. And there you have it, 77 years ago, April 22nd, 1947, Fibber, McGee, and Molly. Guess they went around and around for a while. Uh, let's see, visit our webpage, classicradio.stream, stream our shows. Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find our social media links there, and you can also buy me a copy to help support the show, uh, like Robert and Richard. Now, uh, let's wrap this whole thing up in just a moment with an episode of the soap opera, Claudia.
Not all careless drivers have accidents, but many such careless drivers cause accidents. A woman driver who drives slowly down Main Street while doing a little window shopping is a menace. So is the man who insists on telling the people in the back seat of his car about his poker game last week. It's no wonder that ordinarily cautious drivers start to lose their tempers and take dangerous chances to pass these careless drivers. When an accident results, the person who caused the accident probably won't even be touched. So the National Safety Council says if you want to window shop, get out and walk. If you are too busy describing one of your sterling feats to pay any attention to traffic, get out and walk. The driver's license you have does not give you the right to endanger the lives of your passengers or other human beings. Driving can be dangerous. Keep your mind on what you're doing or walk. And we wrap up this Monday comedy edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox with an episode of Claudia. This goes back 76 years, April 22nd, 1948. They are in the gloaming. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax. And while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. This is where the Nortons live. David and Claudia Norton. The very same. Don't you think they have a nice house? No. No better than a lot of other houses. I think it's a lot better. And it's going to be a lot better yet. Well, everything looks nicer at this time of day, that's all. I can't see why everything looks nicer just because the sun's going down. Oh, there's just enough light to see the good points without noticing the imperfections. Same color light they use in restaurants and nightclubs. Since when do you know so much about nightclubs? Oh, I, I used to go all the time when I lived in the city. Fancy that. You really don't know a person until you start living with, with him in the country, I guess. I used to... Uh, uh, sow just wild oats, and now I'm sowing country oats. Oats too bad. <gasps> what do you know about that? <laughs> Still, some change is bound to turn up pretty soon. Oh, that <laughs> is the worst yet. Darling, let's not go into the house for a minute. It's too beautiful outside. I believe this is called the gloaming. I always thought the gloaming was a place. You did not. Yes, I did, a long time ago. Convenient of the sun to... Set right behind our hill, isn't it? Nice to know it's there. I'm surprised Jared Tucker let us keep it when he sold us the house. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have if he'd had a chance not to. I guess not. What'd you do in the city today? How was it? How's Roger? Did you have the best bit on the school job? Oh, everything's fine. What'd you do today? Oh, I didn't do anything. I know that, but besides doing nothing, what else did you do? Well, let's see. I had breakfast. That's novel. Then I drove my husband to the station. You drove your husband to the station? Exactly. My, what a good memory you have. As a matter of fact, I drove you to the station. And then Mama and I went shopping. That sounds ominous. <laughs> what did you shop? We shopped dinner. And liver for the cat. And a bone for Bluff. And those little screw things you hang cups on. Mm -hmm. Did you put them up? Well, I didn't want my husband to have anything to do when he gets home. Oh, that would be terrible. It would be terrible. I might be reduced to reading a book. That's another thing we shopped. A book? Yep. You bought a book? Mm-hmm. And we got uh, material for the kitchen curtains, and Mama's starting to sew it already. I didn't ask and... what's Mama doing. What did you do? Mm, nothing much. I called Dr. Rowland in New York. Is something wrong? Are you all right? I'm fine. Dr. Rowland said I'm a perfect example of the normal woman. The normal woman will never be able to show her face again. What else did he say? He said I should call him next week and the week after I should come in to see him. You sure that's all he said? And he said that if there were more women like me, there would be fewer doctors. Proud of me? <laughs> Busting. <laughs> Aren't you hungry? Oh, David, don't let's go in yet. That's something I want to show you. What now? You see, David, I can't just sit here in the country all day and not do anything. Not do anything? By just the list of things you, you reeled off. You did a lot more than I did today. I mean, not really do anything. David, I read a book. The same book you bought or a different one? The same one I bought. Oh. That's why I bought it. Oh. It's about farming. Well? Well? 
Did you learn anything you didn't know? David, the book tells you exactly how to run a little farm. And that's what I'm going to do while you're in the city every day. Well, that's going to take up your mornings. But what are you going to do all afternoon? Uh, read more books? You'd be surprised how interesting it sounds. Easy, too, I suppose. Those no. books always make it sound so easy. No, 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 this one didn't. It made it sound hard. Really? And that's why I'm only going to do half of what the book says. Well, which half are you going to do, the sowing or the reaping? Oh, I know what that means now. You can't fool me a minute. I thought I was going to do the farming around here. You're going to do the cows, but Mom and I are going to do the farming. Oh, I see. You see, you can't call cows farming, the book says. Mm. This book you read certainly knows where it stands, doesn't it? David, how do you know? How do I know what? Stands, that's just what the book's about. Mama and I are going to run a roadside stand. Oh, you are, eh? Mm-hmm. And you have your road all picked out, I suppose. No, not the road, but the crop. I know exactly what we're going to plant. What? Lilies of the valley? Asparagus. Why asparagus? Just because you learned how to spell it, I suppose. No, because asparagus, you can make $500 an acre, the book says. David, I'm not being silly. Nobody said you were. Well, you have that look. Anyway, we're going to have a hired man to take care of the cows, and, and he can do the heavy work. Mm -hmm. And then Mom and I can spray the bugs and spread the fertilizer and, and cut off the asparagus. Mm -hmm. David, did you know they cut off the asparagus when it comes up and then it just keeps right on coming? <laughs> <laughs> That's some book you read. And then Mama can sit in the stand and sell the asparagus. Uh, what does Mama have to say about that? That's just it. I haven't dared tell her. But don't you think you'd better? I can't. Why not? Well, Mama doesn't like asparagus. <laughs> then I think she would be happy to sell it to somebody else. I have the spot picked out where I think we can raise it. And that's why I didn't want to go into the house. You want to look at it now? Well, I, I, I think it's better to see it before it gets dark. Don't you? I guess you're right there. I'm getting pretty hungry, though. Well, we're having lamb chops for dinner. Mama just put them in so they wouldn't be ready anyway. Come on, it's so lovely out. Madame, your invitation for a promenade in the gloaming is duly received, noted, and accepted. Let's go. Hmm. It's a little chilly. You're sure you're not cold, darling? Oh, this cold is lots warmer than it looks. It better be. <laughs> that must be the Abbott's police dog. It's bad enough you listen in on their telephone conversations. Now you're going to start eavesdropping on their dogs. I love the sound of things far off in the country, don't you? Mm. The country's beginning to get you a little, isn't it? It'll get me even more when we have asparagus. Now, I want you to see just what I planned. How much are you going to plant? Half an acre. Oh, the book says a whole acre, but I think I'll start on a small scale so it won't be too much work. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to plant them, one acre isn't going to be a great deal more work than a half acre. Isn't it? No. It's uh, all the work of getting the ground ready. Oh. You know, this uh, farm business uh, hasn't been planted on in years. Oh, I know, I know. But you see, I have that all figured out. It's really, it's very, very simple when you know how. Do tell. You see... Now, you see this field here, this one mm -hmm. off there? This is just right, David. I know it's How just right. How do you know right. it's right? Well, it, it looks just like the picture in the book with the brook down there. Say, that brook's really noisy now, isn't it? Do you know what those funny little green plants are? See, way down where it's wet there? Uh, skunk cabbage. How'd you find that out? David, are you sure you haven't read that book? <laughs> No, I, I hate to disillusion you, but there's plenty of skunk cabbage in Central Park in New York in the spring. Well, I didn't know that. How do you know all these things? Oh, in my wide experience in the world, I have made it my business to collect uh, such miscellaneous, fascinating, entertaining, and useless information <laughs> as possible. I think it's a jip that there's skunk cabbage in New York, don't you? You think it's unfair for anything anywhere else to be like our farm, is that it? I don't think anything can really be like our farm. There's certainly no other farmer like you. Oh, that's where you're wrong. I'm going to be just like any other farmer, only better. I'm going to be scientific. Naturally, naturally. You've read a book. Come along, come along. Up the slope. Hey, be careful. Don't get your feet wet. There's a place across the brook here. I found it this afternoon. Well, where? if you're going to plant the asparagus here, why do we have to go up the hill? Will you get a better idea on the hill? Oh, I see. You know, the first thing we have to do if we're going to plant asparagus, you know what it is? Oh, certainly. 
We have to get a little piece of red ribbon to tie them in bunches. We have to prepare the land. <laughs> How are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to spend the whole year planting cover crops. Oh. And then I'm going to get a disc harrow and plant them all over again. Amazing. David, listen now. What do you think is a better cover crop, field peas or domestic rye grass? Mm, you're two cover crops ahead of me already. And what do you think of the pH factor? I didn't know we had one. We don't. That's the whole point. We have to get one right away. Can we send away for it? Oh, now, don't be silly. It's a test to see how much acid we have in the soil. Oh. You, 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 you dairy farmers, you don't know much about raising crops, do you? Well, I guess we dairy farmers have to rely on uh, you crop farmers for instructions. See how that field looks from up here? Yeah. Looks beautiful, doesn't it? It's just the right shape for efficient operation. I never quite thought of it that way. Well, cows wouldn't either. But when you're running a tractor... You when have you're to... running a tractor, you mean? Me? <laughs> and when did we get this tractor, anyway? Now, tractors are really much better than horses, David. Uh, they don't make as nice a noise, anyway. But the upkeep is so much cheaper. Well, let's see. Now, we got as far as the disc harrow. Didn't I say anything about irrigation and fertilizers? No, you spared me those. David, you would be surprised by the number of inefficient farmers in this country. I was just amazed. Did anything I say give you the impression that I'm not amazed? What are you amazed about? I'm amazed about how much you can learn in one afternoon with the right book. Well, there certainly is. Some people are sentimental about farming. But when I run a farm, it's going to be run properly. And it can be a lot of fun, oh, too. Oh, of course. We'll have fun. Mm. But if you'll excuse me, I think that before we start planting cover crops and buying tractors, we ought to find a uh, hired man. Oh, we'll find one. And maybe if Mama takes to this the way I have, we won't need one as much as we thought. You know, the book said that all you have to hire is little boys to pick the berries. What berries? Well, they come after the asparagus. I think that's what it said. I think we'd better read that book over again just to be sure they don't come first. Oh, David. <laughs> what are you remembering now? Darling. Hmm? Look at our house. It's a handsome house from here, isn't it? I've never seen it from here just when it's beginning to get dark. Doesn't it look warm and friendly with the lights on? Knowing that it's yours and mine. And this is our land. We can do anything we want to to it. It's ours. You like that feeling, don't you? I do. David, it makes us very important people, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It gives us kind of a trust. I know. We have to take care of it so that whoever comes after us can feel the same way about it, too. We have to take care of it because, well, because we're us. Maybe we owe it to the farm to plant more than just asparagus. Maybe strawberries and corn Standing and... here on this hill at dusk like this, you can't even notice all the asparagus that aren't growing. You can't? <laughs> Besides which, there's only one thing we owe to this farm. What, David? And that's to be happy here. Then we don't owe it anything at all, darling. And I never will. <laughs> more and more places of business are putting in Coca-Cola coolers so that employees can pause during the day and refresh themselves. You don't need to install a special cooler at home. Just keep a supply of Coca-Cola in the refrigerator. Then you can pause between household tasks and enjoy delicious, refreshing Coke. Stands to reason you'll finish your work with less effort if you work refreshed. You know, I think Claudia's eyes are a little bit stronger than her hands and her back. What do you think, Joe? Yes, I don't think she's going to be able to raise that half acre of asparagus all by herself. Confidentially, Joe, I don't think she thinks so either. But I'm glad she's gotten so excited about the possibilities. Never thought your wife would turn into a farm girl, did you, David? <laughs> you can't hope for the impossible, but sometimes the impossible happens. For instance, I've given up hoping to find a handyman or a farmer for the place. As you said, the impossible may happen. Maybe Claudia will find somebody for you tomorrow. If anybody can find me a farmer, it'll be Claudia. And I'd love to see him. He'll really be something. Well, keep hoping till tomorrow. I'll see you then. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, David. As I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. 
This broadcast of Claudia was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. And there you have it, Claudia, from 76 years ago, April 22nd, 1948. Tomorrow, we will uh, focus on April 23rd, 1949, for episodes of The 13th Juror, starring Vincent Price, and uh, an episode of Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Then we'll move to Bulldog Drummond, starring Ned Weaver, also Nick Carter, Master Detective, starring Lon Clark, and another episode of Superman. That'll be coming up on our Tuesday program. Have a great Monday, and we shall talk with you manana for more Classic Radio Theater. I'm Wyatt Cox.